So come on up. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seats. Um, we don't want anyone blocking the doorways um, for fire safety reasons. So please come on up and take a seat. And welcome to the um, regular May meeting. And it's May 12th of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Can we have the roll call, please? Yes. Chairman Lynch. Present. Councillor Backer. Present. Councillor Dill. Councillor Lennon. Present. Councillor McKenney. Here. Councillor Rowe. Here. And Councillor Swift Kayata. Here. Here. Okay. <laughs> and Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll wait a few seconds more for people to be seated. There's a seat right up front, sir. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Please clear the doorway. OK, um, we will get started. Um, we have the minutes from our April 14th meeting. Do I have a motion? David? I move the adoption of the minutes from our April 14, 2008 regular meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah. I have a couple of um, corrections or changes on page two, uh, the third paragraph. Um, it's, it says, <laughs> lastly, Councillor someone. That would be me. Reported. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, so that's Councillor Rowe. So we need to insert the word row. Mm. And, and actually, then, uh, oh. in that same paragraph, uh, we'll meet Thursday to consider probably proposals would be the, uh, the correct word there. Uh, the request for proposal, proposals were okay. submitted by the architects, and we were actually considering the proposals. Thank you. OK, thank you. Anne, any um, other chances? Yes, a couple other things. On the third page, halfway down, uh, you see the motion that I made and then seconded by Councillor Backer, a discussion. It says, Councillor Swift Kayata said, significant citizen interest in, I presume it's in, in this issue is her reason for making this referral and wants to hear, I think it, we should have, and she wants to hear the thoughts of the planning board. And I think there was one more. On page seven, uh, on it's sort of the, the continuation of, it's between item 66 and 67. The second paragraph down says, Chairman Lynch asked to recuse herself from the vote due to a personal relationship, so on and so forth. And then Chair, Chairman Lynch stepped down and Councillor Rowe took the chair. It, it seems to me that that and, those motion, and the motion needs to go underneath item 67. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. So, so we'll that needs move. to go under 67. And then halfway down, there's another motion. It says C, Swift, Swift Kayata. That should be A, Swift Kayata. Made the motion to refer this item to the planning board, period. It wasn't for the purpose of discussion. I think, I, I think what I probably said, well, I will make this motion for the purpose of discussion. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the motion. Okay. Thank you. And then. Um, Right below, vote two in favor, four opposed. It said, uh, discussion, Mr. McGovern recommended that the council make a finding of fact that it is either legally faulty or conflicts with state wall law. And I'm not sure what it is supposed to be. So I didn't know if the manager wanted to change that wording or? If you'd like, I'd look at it, but I I'd okay. want to look at it in context. Okay, and then the very last line, it says, Mr. McGovern recommended having the town attorney draft findings of fact so that it is sustainable with the majority of the council. I, I wasn't sure I understood what that line meant. And then lastly, I know this is a pain, page 8, right after it says, Councillor Lennon left at 10.05 p.m., I think we might want to stick in there that Councillor Lynch resumed as chair. 
Very mm -hmm. good. So those are my changes. Although I would be happy for Jim to chair mm -hmm. the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So noted. Okay, are there any further changes in the minutes? No further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Town manager's report. I'll pass. Oh, I'm first. sorry. I skipped over reports and correspondence. Do we have any? Jim? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it's becoming too common uh, lately, but uh, we were saddened once again to hear yes. of the uh, passing of uh, a former school board member, Keith Wetherill. Uh, Keith and I were colleagues on the school board for one year. Um, he was serving the last of nine years, I believe, on the school board, and I was in my first year. Uh, Keith was a wonderful man, a very bright man, uh, had a, an excellent demeanor for public service, and, and as a newcomer on the school board, I certainly looked at him, looked to him for a reasonable and reasoned approach to problem solving, and he'll be greatly missed. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Cynthia. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I would also note that we have correspondence that uh, unfortunately um, reports the resignation of Jack Haley from the school board. And I would just like to thank Jack um, publicly for his service and um, um, tell him that we'll certainly miss him on the school board, but appreciate the time that he put in. Thank you. And I'd just like to mention um, I'm on the uh, wellness committee of the um, school board and uh, the wellness committee along with community services is sponsoring on every Wednesday in June bike walk to school on Wednesday so I want to uh, just make that announcement so that our um, citizens especially drivers will be alert to our our school children either biking or walking to school on the Wednesdays in June and that's part of our efforts to encourage physical fitness among the youth of the town so okay. Michael I'll pass no town managers report citizens item of dis uh, citizens discussion of items not on the agenda if you are here tonight to speak about something that is not on our agenda now is the time for you to speak so if you're here to speak about the budget, the school budget, the municipal budget, the arts commission budget, all of those things are on our agenda and you'll have opportunity to speak in a little while. But if you have something new you want to bring to the council's attention, now is a good time to do it. Um, we also will have an opportunity at the very end of the meeting to do the same thing, although I caution you that it may be much later than usual. So um, if there's anyone here that would like to speak to items not on our agenda. I'm not sure whether someone's taking a seat. Okay. Um, seeing none, we will move to our agenda. And the first item is item 67, and that is an item that I have recused myself from. So I will ask um, Jim Rowe to chair this portion of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, some of you may recall that uh, last month we had an item on our agenda. The town has received a request from Chuck Filietas, who is a property owner on Shore Road, uh, to exclude flagpoles from the definition of structure and to provide a side yard and rear yard setback of, of five feet for flagpoles. Um, we have Attorney McGeehy, who represents uh, Mr. Filietas, uh, with us tonight and has asked uh, permission to speak. And we also have uh, another party involved who would like to speak. So I'll turn the floor over. First, need to get it on the table. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I would, I would entertain a, a motion to, uh, to have this item taken off the table. So I move that we remove item 67-2008, requested ordinance amendment, uh, from the table. Second. Moved and seconded. Yes, just um, by way of discussion, I would just request that we had received as counselors a letter from Mr. Filiats um, 
Philotas. Philotas, thank you. Philotas. Um, Philotas, and I um, think that the letter, the letter wasn't in our packet, but I do think it should be part of the record, so I would just request that that letter be somehow um, made available and included. In so noted. Other discussion on the motion? All in favor of moving the item from the table? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, very well, Attorney okay. McGee. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rowe. I'm uh, Peggy McGee, and uh, I appeared before you last month. Uh, you'll recall that uh, when we uh, came to speak about the right to fly the American flag anywhere you want in the yard, and this is a, really a civics lesson about so many different legal principles tonight, um, I was told um, more than one way, including from the town manager, that it was going to be a reference to a uh, routine reference motion to the uh, planning board for a hearing and uh, th therefore there might be a little background information but it wasn't going to be a fact-finding hearing and on that basis I uh, advise Mr. Philotez not to spend the time to come out here uh, but to wait for the hearing. Uh, I feel like I was misled and I um, and I gave him that uh, wrong advice. So Mr. Philotez is here tonight and uh, would appreciate the opportunity to speak to you as well when I'm finished. Uh, the, uh, our Judge Janu here in Maine said many years ago that the procedure and the process by which a judge or a counsel makes a decision is as important as the decision itself. And the process and the procedure that this counsel used last month was not, it was, uh, it was unlawful, um, it was a complete blindside, you voted. Uh, four to two uh, to uh, deny a public hearing on this issue about being able to fly the American flag where you want to on your property. And then when your town manager advised you that you had not complied with your own regulations under Section 1910, then you tabled it so that the attorney could come up with a finding. And I will tell you that the, the finding that he's proposed is nonsense. I'll tell you why in a minute that you could tack on to your denied motion uh, after the fact. Uh, the issues that are involved here are freedom of expression. You know last year, or was it two years ago, Congress uh, adopted the uh, right to display the American flag act. It doesn't apply here, but it certainly uh, does show the importance of that um, uh, protection. Equal protection, due process, uh, freedom of access with the private conversations that counselors had with an, uh, someone who was opposed to this beforehand. We didn't have that information. We didn't know that. I'd gotten a court decision last uh, year to, uh, from uh, Judge Delahanty that uh, said a decision about an amendment to an ordinance is invalid if it was made based on information that was not made available to the public. I do not believe that we had information given to us. The standard that was used, and it was reported in the newspaper, is this is a can of worms. There was no worms that I presented to you. We, used, we were just asking, can we have the flagpole stay where it was installed? Mr. Philotez contractor, he's here tonight, um, went to Mr. Smith and said, do I need a permit for this flagpole? No, you don't. We, know, we never regulate here in Cape Elizabeth flagpoles. So he installed it after he contacted his neighbor, planned to put a, a flagpole here. No objection, no limitations about where it was put. Then when it was put into the ground, as to Mr. Villatez only, the only person in Cape Elizabeth, the town said, we're going to issue a notice of violation unless you remove it. I do not know why this, the town is, wants him to dig this thing up and move it three yards. Uh, but for, we thought that we would bring to you, since there is a technical definition about structure, an amendment so that you could be consistent with your policy. And that was going to go to your planning board for review, we thought. But at the last month, there was some kind of can of worm standard. We met with the abutter. He objected. He met with him privately. So now uh, we're going to deny having, you having a hearing. Uh, as you recall, Mr. Philotez is, uh, comes from generations of flag displayers, including General Philotez, uh, his grandfather and namesake, and these are all folks from Maine, from Bar Harbor to the county to Lewiston. 
to his father, who was in the Coast Guard here out of Portland, to himself, who was the flag boy in the Lewiston Grammar School, and uh, then was in the ROTC. Uh, they want to fly the American flag. I think it's kind of ironic. We were just um, uh, saluting the flag. What you should have done is, if you wanted to deny the request, you should have postponed it so that he could come here um, and then listen to everything. There apparently were some communications that we have no idea yet what they were about, so we can't rebut them. Please do not make your decision based on a can of worm standard. Now, why is the motion that the attorney proposed nonsense? What it says is, our ordinance says that a flagpole is a structure and therefore we can't amend it, because that's a policy. Then you can never amend your ordinance. If you think about it, if, if you can't ever change your ordinance if it's against your policy, and your policy is defined by what the ordinance says, you'll never change your ordinance. And that's what the attorney has brought forward to you. What we request of you is that you start over and that you hold yourself to the same standard you held Mr. Philitas to. You want him technically to go by the book. Please go by the book about your own section 1910. It says you must send things to the public hearing unless it's illegal or it's against your policy. Your policy, as Mr. Smith has told you, has always been not to regulate flagpoles. So give Mr. Philitas a hearing. And what we'd ask you to do is to reverse your denial of last month and send this on to the planning board for a full hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chuck Philadez. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. I won't waste it. I have four items, excuse me, five items. Uh, special treatment, law, due process, it's five follow the rules, and view. I'm not here to showboat tonight. We have important matters to take care of, but I do believe this is an important one. I'm not up here asking for special treatment. I'm just asking for you to treat me as you've treated every other citizen in Cape Elizabeth by not regulating their flagpoles. I think it's clear, you've read my letter, that we followed due process. We checked with Bruce Smith, he said we did not need a permit. He said he, historically they had never regulated flagpoles. We checked with the DEP. They allow it. With, their rules technically address flagpoles as being within the 75-foot setback. Uh, so I was following the rules. And I even went to my neighbor, told him where I was going to place that flagpole, and he never raised an objection to it until the day it went into the ground. Now, there's some hearsay on the other part, and I won't muddy the waters with that. I understand what we're discussing today is the ability to discuss a change in ordinance. Let's stick to that. And all that I ask is that you allow us to explore that more fully. Uh, the final piece that I'll say is I think the main reason why the decision to allow us to have the flagpole was reversed is because one citizen, my neighbor, felt it was intrusive of his view. And if you have yet to read the letter that I sent to you and look at the illustration that's attached to it, or if you have the opportunity to go to the property, I know you have busy schedules, you'll see that moving that flagpole 15 more feet will absolutely in no way change view whatsoever or have any kind of consequence to noise restrictions as I, th as I think he's contended. As well, if it, I understand two of you uh, have had the opportunity to go and spend some time with M Mr. Nelson, but those of you ha who haven't, you'll notice standing in his house, anywhere in his house, that flagpole in no way obstructs any ocean view. If, it, if it, it's obstructing a view, it's the view to the side, which is my property, and a cliff beyond. That's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Philotas. Attorney Vaniotis, who represents uh, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Council. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Vaniotis here on behalf of Bruce Nelson, who is the abutter to Mr. Philotas. 
a few points, and I'll try to make them as quick as possible, seeing that you have uh, very important issues to deal with tonight and lots of people who want to talk about them. First of all, you are the legislative body of the town, and therefore there's no prohibition against you folks talking to your constituents, to the voters of the town. So all of you were invited to come out to Mr. Nelson's property and take a look and see what you could see. You're not a court of law, you're the elected legislative body, just as I can pick up my phone and call my state legislator, or I can call my congressman, or at least talk to my congressman's office. Uh, you had every right to talk to Mr. Nelson, and Mr. Nelson had every right to contact you folks and invite you to come see his property. So I don't think there's an issue of anybody's due process being violated here. Mr. Filiataz obviously had the same option of picking up the telephone and calling you folks, although I do know Mr. Nelson is a voter in Cape Elizabeth. I'm not sure if Mr. Filiataz is, but the point is, as an elected, Filiataz, I'm sorry, sir, as an elected legislative body in the town, there was no due process violation by virtue of the fact that you went out and saw the property and had some telephone conversations or some in-person conversations with Mr. Nelson. Um, what happened at the last meeting did not violate the town's ordinance. It did exactly what the town's ordinance says the council is allowed to do. The council is the legislative body when it gets a request from outside of the town administration to change the zoning ordinance has the option of passing it on to the planning board. Or if the council finds one of three things, one of which is that it would violate existing town policy, simply to stop it at that point. As I indicated last time, it's a little bit like the notion of a bill never getting out of committee in the legislature or in the Congress. The council ultimately decides what's in the zoning ordinance, and the council can decide in the first instance when a request first comes in front of it, whether it wishes to, to send that request any further. Uh, the council already voted by a vote of four of its members that this should not go any further, that it should essentially stop here. Tonight's motion is, is simply a finding in support of the vote that was previously made by the council with your legal counsel doing what legal counsel gets paid to do, and that is sometimes to help the council with putting a motion in proper order and explaining the basis for a determination that was made by the council. The ordinance says what it says. It defines structure, and a flagpole is not exempted from the definition of structure. We think that's a good policy, and there's no reason for the council to change it. For all the reasons we discussed last time, a flagpole can have just as much of an impact as any other structure if it's located within what is otherwise the applicable setback. So this really isn't about freedom of expression. It's not prohibiting anybody from flying the American flag. It's about what the town's definition of structure is and whether there's any reason to change that definition as is currently requested. The, that section of the ordinance that says you can stop a request at the first step if you find that it's contrary to existing town policy doesn't mean you can never amend the ordinance. Because again, I think what we're seeing here is a custom or practice being described as the town's policy. In this case, it appears what the code enforcement officer is saying is, well, flagpoles have really never been an issue before. Nobody's ever questioned whether they have to comply with the setbacks. We haven't bothered with it. There's been a kind of benign neglect concerning flagpoles. But in this case, Mr. Nelson looked at this flagpole, and although he had said he had no objection to a flagpole, he never said, I have no objection to a flagpole that's located within the required setback. So when the flagpole went up within the setback, he contacted the code enforcement officer, who essentially said, well, the ordinance really says it's a structure, but we've kind of never done it that way because Apparently, it's never been an issue before. Well, that's not the town's policy. That's, that's a practice. The code enforcement officer can't make policy. So we're suggesting to the council there's no reason to change the town's policy. The town's policy is in the ordinance. It only exempts fences from the definition of structure. That's all. <coughs> a flagpole is a structure. The ordinance currently covers it. Uh, Mr. Filiataz, Filiataz, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time with your name. Mine is difficult, too. Uh, the abutter certainly has whatever options are available to appeal a decision of the code enforcement officer, but changing the ordinance because of this one concern with respect to two pieces of property, it strikes us as overkill, uh, and one that the council has already said uh, is not appropriate. Thank you.
Thank you, Attorney Van Otis. Are there others who would speak to this issue? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to uh, ascertain the, the pleasure of the, of the town council at this point. David? Um, <clears throat> I would like, as a member of the group of four councillors who opposed sending the request for the ordinance amendment to the planning board to move to reconsider the vote. Moved and seconded that we reconsider the vote that was taken at the last uh, town council meeting. A discussion on the motion. Ann? Uh, I'd like to support David's motion to reconsider, reconsider it uh, for a couple of reasons. I was one of the two that, um, of the, the losing two, that thought we should go forward um, with sending uh, this request on to the planning board. And I uh, think that we should, because I think that's the usual process when a, a citizen requests uh, a, a change to the zoning ordinance. And I saw no reason and still see no reason why we shouldn't let that usual process go forward. And um, I have concerns with the draft motion here, which if we ever get to that one, um, I can express. So I'm supporting David's motion to reconsider this. Thank you, Ann. Other comments on the motion to reconsider? I will. Uh, I'll be voting against the motion to reconsider. I have uh, read nothing in, in the letter that has changed my mind, nor have I heard anything, any comment tonight that has changed my mind on this issue. I would uh, I'll keep my vote the same as it was last month. Yeah. I, I'd like to make a comment. <clears throat> I, I agree with Jim's comments exactly. Those are my thoughts as well. I see no reason to change. Yep. Sarah? I agree with that as well. Cynthia? Yes, thank you. Um, I was one of the two in the minority. I don't want to call us losers, Anne. Um, <laughs> and I will be supporting the motion to reconsider. And I also was asked by uh, Mr. Walt Simpson, um, who is a resident on Susan Road, but who is in Florida. He called and asked me to pass along that he, in his capacity as uh, owner of Allen Flag, installed the pole. And, um, he just asked me to pass along to everybody that um, when the neighbor came over, they checked with the code enforcement officer, they were given the okay, and that it will cost um, Mr. Filates, um, in his view, a significant sum of money to move the flag. So I'm just simply passing that along because I was asked to um, by <coughs> Mr. Simpson, but I will be supporting the motion to reconsider because I do think that, um, that, uh, that my personal feeling is that the, um, the finding, especially as it um, describes a finding of fact is, 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 is erroneous because we didn't have a fact-finding hearing. And so I, I think that there, there may very well be a fact-finding of the sort that's described in um, the motion that was drafted by the attorney, but it seems to me premature to have a fact-finding hearing when there hasn't been ample opportunity for a hearing on the facts. Thank you, Cynthia. Other David? If I could speak briefly um, in support of my motion to reconsider in hopes of perhaps persuading one of the three who don't seem inclined to support it, which means that it will fail as a tied three to three uh, vote. Um, the reason that I'm making the motion to reconsider is that um, after reading uh, Mr. Philotas, thank you, um, response um, and trying to be a good steward of what we know are scarce dollars in our town coffers. Um, I'd like to take one issue off the table to be litigated and for us to pay our attorney to defend. And that is the procedural issue of whether this should go to the planning board. Um, and I'll make it clear that I do not support the ordinance amendment. Um, and I'm not making the motion to reconsider, nor do I think it should be sent to the planning, be court because, planning board because I think the amendment should be made. Um, I don't think it should. I think the ordinance should stand as it is, but I'd like to see it run as a force through the planning board 
um, and just take the issue of procedural irregularity out of any argument that our attorney has to defend um, in any court. And that's my reason for wanting to see it go to the planning board. Thank you, David. Chip, sorry. Uh, Sarah, then Ann. I just have a question. If it goes to the planning board, what is their job then? To, to, to talk about whether we should change the ordinance? Their job would be to come up with a recommendation, uh, Mike. Yeah, any issue that's referred to the planning board uh, before it comes back to the council is required to have a public hearing, and it would then come back to the town council with a recommendation. So it would go be vetted through the planning board, they would make a decision and make a recommendation which would then come back to the council? Correct. Thank you. Ann? I'd just like to, oops, I'd just like to add to my comments um, because we're, so far it looks like we're tied at 3-3. Three, three, so. um, as I said before, I was one of the two in, that did not prevail. Um, and uh, I want to make it clear that I neither support nor don't support the amendment itself. I, I don't really have any opinion about flagpoles as structures or flagpoles with, within certain uh, side limits of yards or anything like that. My, qu my concern is that every other time that I've been on the council that I can recall, any time someone has requested an ordinance change from us, we have followed the usual procedure. We've sort of given them their day to go and make their point of view known to the planning board. The planning board does their thing with it, comes back with a recommendation to us, and then, you know, we adopt it or we don't adopt it or whatever. As I said, I have no opinion at this point on the merits of this. But I just think it's, it's not right to just cut it off and say, don't send it through the regular process for whatever reason. I don't know why we wouldn't do the regular process. And <clears throat> secondly, when I look at this draft motion um, that I guess would be the next motion if this one fails, um, I don't think that um, <clears throat> this draft motion as worded, it says such amendment is clearly contrary to established town policy. I don't think the amendment that was suggested was contrary to established town policy. That's just me, my personal opinion. And I also think this last reason that the town um, has required setbacks for structures for decades, hence the proposed amendment is clearly contrary to established town policy regarding setbacks for structures. Well, going by that logic, it seems that any proposed ordinance change, any change that anybody came to us with would be contrary to the cur current ordinance. I mean, by definition, if you're proposing a change, it's contrary to the current ordinance. So if that's, so why is that a reason to deny the process from proceeding? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me, that we're, because it's contrary, a proposed change is contrary to the current ordinance, so we wouldn't let it proceed. If that's the reason, why do we ever let any proposed change proceed? So I have real, concerns about this draft motion, and I have concerns procedurally why we would treat this citizen differently than everybody else I've ever seen that I recall coming before this group that I've been here, the eight years. So that's why I'm supporting David Backer's motion. Yeah. Thank you, Ann. Paul? I, um, after listening to David's legal argument, which I have great respect for his legal expertise and Ann's logic, I will vote in favor of sending it to the planning board. I think that's reasonable. Sarah? Well, I, I would too. Okay. As long as it mm -hmm. has a process. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to change my vote. It just, <coughs> it just amazes me that we're spending this much time on a flagpole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is about correcting a mistake. It, it's, about, uh, it's about satisfying a complaint that's supported by ordinance. It seems to me that the most reasonable way uh, to correct this mistake is to move the flagpole, um, not to change the law. Uh, I will say again that if the flagpole was placed in its present position because of inaccurate or incomplete information that was provided by our code enforcement officer, then the town should pay for the 
uh, change in, in uh, the flagpole situation. That's, uh, that's the way I feel. Can we Any other discussion? I was just going to say, can we move the question? We can. Uh, all in favor of the motion uh, reconsider. to reconsider the uh, last month's uh, finding? Opposed? 5-1. We need a motion on the item. Yeah, we need a motion on the item. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I would uh, move that we refer um, the request for an ordinance amendment to the planning board. Second. Hearing. Second. Moved and seconded that the item be uh, referred to the planning board for consideration. Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Oh, David had his. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Um, I, I will be voting in favor of it, um, but not because I, again, not because I support the merits of the request to change the ordinance. And I agree with Councilor Rose's comment um, about this. Well, I don't agree with the town paying for it, but I agree with the fact that this is correcting a mistake, and the easy solution here is just to move the flagpole. And if it's moving the flagpole three yards, as Mr. Philotas's council suggests, then move it three yards and let everybody move on. Um, I would also like to just respond briefly to this fact-finding hearing that we're being accused of having held at our last meeting. Uh, despite the fact that what we're hearing is we're not supposed to be hearing any facts, we've heard an awful lot of facts tonight from Mr. Philotas and his council. And I don't know whether we're not supposed to listen to them because they're facts, or whether we are supposed to listen to them, but we're not supposed to take them into account. But I don't think we can have it both ways. We're either supposed to listen to facts or we're not at this stage. Um, and the only other thing I'd like to say is that this is not a competition to see who can proclaim to be the most patriotic person in the room. Nobody's questioning Mr. Philotas' patriotism or his, his desire to fly the flag or deny him the right to fly the flag or questioning the patriotism of his grandfather or his father or to deny him the ability to teach his son to respect the flag. Um, those are all private matters between him and his family. And it won't, doesn't affect the way I view this amendment or request um, in, in any way. Um, nobody's trying to deny anyone's patriotic ancestral heritage. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say about that's it. Thank you, David. Okay. Jim. Yeah. I, have, I have one further comment. Um, I will be s supporting this, but um, I did want to add that I was quite concerned by the statements that it was improper for a citizen to be talking to me or any other counselor about a matter of concern to him or her. And I, it's my opinion, mm -hmm. and I think I'm on firm ground here, that it is not improper for citizens to give me a call, send me an email, stop me at the IGA or whatever, to express their opinion, whatever. And I don't think there was any real need to, for us to quote unquote disclose like it was a big secret that someone had sent us an email or written us a letter or called us about this, that's entirely proper. It is improper for the council to have secret meetings on things, but I don't think that's what anyone intended. And I, I would add that um, I was offended by those, by those allegations. Can I say something? No, no. Could have met with Mr. Phillips's private. I haven't given you the floor, me. please. I, I've got. To, I mean, I, I've been just accused of saying that something was improper. What's not right is to say that based on a can of worms on information <clears> that no one in the public knows about, decisions are made, and that we have the case decision that says that. I'd be happy to give you a copy. I believe you're out of order. So. I am out of order. I just wanted to let you know. I don't think that what you did was improper. Uh, can I just suggest that we've been here for 45 minutes. We have a whole lot of people who want to talk, including a lot of students who need to go to bed and do their homework. And I think the flagpole thing. Can we vote? Not, not yet. Got to move. 
Uh, it's too important to let it slide. I, I, I think we were um, improperly talked to and, and accused of things we didn't do. And I was offended personally and professionally in this role. And I agree with your argument, Jim, and I would like to kill this matter tonight. But I understand David's reasoning in, in order for the town to avoid more legal battles and expenses that take money out of the coffers that we can use for other good purposes. <coughs> That's the only reason I'm sending it to the uh, planning board. Thank you. Seeing no further comment, uh, all in favor of the motion to refer the issue to the planning board. Opposed? Votes 5 1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay. Um, we have a report from the Ordinance Committee, and uh, just to move this along, um, it is to schedule a public hearing on proposed changes to the sign ordinance, and this is um, in support of uh, our farming community. Um, so it is recommended to set this for public hearing on May 27th at 7.30? Tuesday. Tuesday. Is there a second to my motion? All in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the public hearing for the budget. And um, I'd like to spend a minute talking about our process because um, <coughs> what just happened is not normally what happens in our process. And um, I think it's important for us to all understand uh, the town council process. And uh, that way, we'll get a lot done and we'll listen to you. And, um, um, it will be done in, in the right way. So first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, you're all here because you feel strongly about the town and the school and how the town and school's priorities um, are reflected in the town budget. And so we appreciate very much your input and your taking the time to share your views with us. Um, just in terms of the process, um, before I open it up to the public hearing, I'll ask um, Jim Rowe, who is the chairman of our finance committee, to make a short statement about the budget. Then we'll open it up to public comment. Each person here is welcome to address the council <coughs> once for three minutes. I borrowed my son's um, boggle timer. And, um, and, and that's not because we don't want to hear from you. It's because we want to hear from all of you that we have a timer. Um, so I will um, ask you to state your name and your address. However, if you're under 18, we do not want you to state your address publicly. OK? We want to protect um, the um, young adults who are here. When your time is up on the thing, and hopefully it will be visible to you, um, I'll ask you to allow the next person in line to speak. Please address the council when you speak. Sometimes people have a tendency when they get up here to turn and address the people who are here, but then we have a very difficult time hearing what you came to say to us. So we would ask you to address um, us. Um, lastly, we would request no displays of sentiment. Um, there should be no cheering, no booing, or clapping. You know, sometimes an expression of solidarity is innocent enough, but it can have a chilling effect on those who may hold a differing viewpoint and may discourage someone who is here with a minority viewpoint from speaking. And we want to make sure that this is a collegial and open atmosphere for every one of you who's come here tonight. After all of you who wish to speak have spoken, the public hearing will be closed. At that time, the council will discuss the matter. If anyone has further comments to make after that, I encourage you to stay to the end of the meeting where, as we always do, we will open the meeting up once again to public comment. So I thank you again for coming tonight, and I thank you in advance for your courtesy to each person who speaks. And again, Jim will make just a short statement, then we'll open it up to public comment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I took the job of uh, 
Town Council Finance Committee Chairman this year because I'm energized and engaged by challenge. And uh, this budget season hasn't certainly hasn't uh, disappointed uh, in those lines. Uh, I've heard the word unprecedented used in describing the economic conditions uh, and the economic climate in which our department heads, uh, our town manager, the school board, the school superintendent, and the town council have somehow had to fashion a budget in which we remain sensitive to all of our citizens, those who wish to optimize our programs and services, and those for whom escalating property taxes are very problematic. This hasn't been an easy task. My personal goal very early on in the process, as a matter of fact, since uh, before January 14th, in fact, uh, was to try to establish a context and a shared understanding of the conditions under which the budget would need to be built, hoping that we could work more closely together. Though not from lack of effort, uh, this has been somewhat of a, a disappointing endeavor, and, uh, but I accept full responsibility for that. As the weeks and months passed, we were inundated by a host of lousy economic news. Uh, I'd quote the opening line of the town manager's budget introductory uh, narrative, dated March 3rd, 2008. And I quote, today's headlines from msnbc.com and the Wall Street Journal. Building activity drops sharply. Buffett says U.S. in recession. Oil prices climb to new high. Automakers report sales declines. I'm not here, though, to whine about, vic uh, about being victimized by circumstances that are largely beyond our control. We had work to do. On March 4th, the town council, by majority vote, set a spending target of 4.3%. It was hoped that departments would try to come in at or below this level. The school department worked on its budget virtually from the day school opened in September. Other town departments uh, were also beginning to feel and see the challenges that lie ahead last fall. In early March, the town manager delivered proposed municipal budgets to the town council. Later in that month, the school board delivered its proposed budget to the town council after peering down a needs-based budget at, that had been prepared by the superintendent and the district leadership team. In late March, the Town Council Finance Committee reviewed the municipal department budgets and made some adjustments based on anticipated declining revenues, among other things. On April 1st and April 9th, the Town Council Finance Committee heard and discussed the formal presentation of the school board's proposed budget, which called for a 6.0% spending increase. The Finance Committee, by vote of 4 to 3, established a 4.6% spending limit on the school department budget at that time. At last month's town council meeting, the proposed budgets were set for public hearing tonight, and that presumably is why most of you are here. Uh, I, I think I'll end there. I, I had uh, wanted to continue and, and explain where things would go from here, but I think we'll take things in order and, and uh, get the hearing underway. So thank okay. you, Madam thank Chairman. Thank you, Jim. And I just, um, the town manager reminded me that this public hearing is not just on the school issue, it's for any other aspect of this. Uh, municipal budget. I know there are some people here who want to speak on the Arts Commission and perhaps there are other issues. So I'd ask you all to, the best way to do this is to get in a line. Um, maybe the young man in the blue shirt would like to start. <laughs> um, thank you for breaking the ice and I would ask those of you to just line up behind him. And again, state your name and if you're under age 18, please don't give us your address. If you're over, we'd like to have it. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Luke Carey, and I've attended Cape, Cape Elizabeth schools from first grade through 11th grade. I support a 6.6% 6 .6 budget increase. One of the arguments I've heard against the 6% budget is that Cape's SAT scores are high, and therefore we do not need to spend more money on our school. This is not true. Our testing scores are high primarily for two reasons. The first reason that our SAT scores are high is not necessarily dependent on what we learn in classes, but because the majority of CAPE students are privately tutored. In an informal survey, over three quarters of my classmates took SAT prep courses this year. Therefore, our scores do not necessarily reflect the quality of our school. The second major reason for CAPE's high test scores is that we have programs like the Achievement Center. Dr. Melanson and Ms. Jones help out enormously with the writing and reading sections of the SATs. They guide and teach necessary writing and critical reading techniques that are crucial to the development of the student. Their positions in the Achievement Center will be cut under the Town Council recommended budget of 4.6%. 
Simply because our testing scores are high does not mean that money from our school can be cut. We are cutting threads from the fabric that is our school system. Cut enough threads and the fabric will fall apart. This is a school-oriented community. And if we let our school's programs deteriorate, our school and our town will fall apart as well. Uh, many students are here tonight in support of the 6.0% budget. Some will speak, some will not. I'd like to give all students here the chance to show their support for a 6% budget by standing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carey. My name is Elizabeth Briggs, and I'm here tonight to talk about the speech and debate program, which is one of the of several programs that will be cut with the proposed 4.6% budget. One of the main goals of our public education system is to, is to prepare students to be active citizens of our community. As we can all see tonight, speaking publicly and debating the issues is a very valuable skill in life. Two years ago, I never would have thought it was possible that I could stand in front of a group of people without notes and give a speech. But thanks to, my, thanks to the speech and debate program at the high school, I'm able to stand here today. Speech and debate is a great non-athletic program because it offers a wide variety of competition categories, from debating political theory to students recreating storytelling of a traditional children's tale. Through my competition in Maine Principal Association sanctioned competitions, as well as in the national competition last year, I've met a wide variety of students I never would have met otherwise, and have also gained valuable skills and experience that I will use for the rest of my time in high school, and also in college and beyond. I feel that one of the reasons that students are so successful in our community is that there are programs like speech and debate available to them, and I would hate to see future students in our community not have the resources available to them that current students, and myself included, have currently. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Briggs. Uh, hello, my name is Charles Colburn. I am speaking on behalf of Marissa Tereski. <coughs> she is at uh, theater rehearsal, and uh, this is her speech. I am protesting the elimination of the speech club. As a newcomer to the Cape Elizabeth High School Speech Club, I was quite nervous stepping into my first Tuesday evening meeting. I had joined about a month late due to my involvement with the state champion cross-country team. However, this did not alter the positive and welcoming environment that was emitted from the members and coaches of the speech team. One of the main reasons why I decided to add this club to my already bustling schedule was because of my passion for theater. In high school, I have had the honor to participate and observe the works of numerous regional winning one acts, as well as extraordinary musicals. The stars in a majority of these shows got their start and continue to develop their talent with the help of the speech club. I have networked and made numerous relationships that have stemmed from speech competitions. Because I chose to participate in speech events in which the contestant had to write their own pieces, I was encouraged to exercise my passion for writing as well. I got advice of my speech coach as well as constructive criticism from previous year's coaches and my theater teacher. I came to realize later in the game that speech competitions are quite subjective. For those who are un uninformed about the logistics of a speech competition, there are three rounds and one final round in which only the top five remain. The rounds are extremely rigorous and competitive. Because of that, a lot of fun has nothing to do with winning or losing. The joy comes from being in an environment with energetic and supportive people. <clears throat> this past year's speech team experience has been a source of encouragement and support for my goals as a writer and a public speaker on and off of stage. I hope that the last year of my high school career will include my participation in an organization that challenges me to exercise my opinions and thoughts through pieces of writing in an atmosphere that brings me great thrill and enjoyment. And for that reason, I would hate to see the speech team eliminated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Peter Brigham. And like many of my fellow Cape Elizabeth High School students who are here tonight, um, I'm very deeply concerned about budget cuts that would be made under a 4.6% increase. And I'd like to highlight one of the programs to be cut, which is the writing conferences offered at the Achievement Center. 
There's simply no more time left in the day for teachers in any department at the high school, all of whom carry a load of about 100 students to meet individually with students. So that's where the Achievement Center comes in. Having a one-on-one -on -one conference raises the caliber of a final product and also brings a new depth to our study of topics. So the writing coaches meet with students to go over writing assignments for all um, courses across all subjects and also various levels and grades. And these offerings have been extremely well received. So far this year, there have been 851 conferences. There are only about 600 students at the high school, so that says that nearly every student has gone once and a number have gone back. Students are also able to schedule time to work with a writing coach in preparation for the SAT tests. This year, the first time this has been offered, 227 sessions were held. That's nearly two conferences per member of this year's junior class. On the SAT last spring, when this option was not available, 7% of Cape Elizabeth juniors did not meet the standards in writing, and 13% only partially met the standards compared with 2% failing to meet and 10% partially meeting the standards in math. While we outperform most schools on math, the gap narrows when you look at writing scores. SAT scores are a measure of the success of a secondary school, so it's essential that we continue to have writing support readily accessible to all students. Many students, myself included, take an SAT prep course or hire a tutor in advance of the SATs. These courses typically cost $500 to $600. Having that service available for free in the Achievement Center is going to help a lot more students do well. I know that even the 4.6% budget increase is considered to be more than enough to fund essential programs and services, but please keep in mind that that EPS number refers to the bare minimum. I urge the Council to pass a budget with an increase of 6% or more, and I also encourage those of you here and watching at home who will go to the polls to vote on the budget, to vote no on any budget that does not provide for an increase of at least 6%. Good schools are in the best interest of our entire community, but the community support of increased funding is vital. Good evening, my name is Sarah Friedman and I have attended the Cape Elizabeth School System from first through 11th grade. Public Law 94-142 the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act states that in order to receive federal funds, states must develop and implement policies that assure a free and appropriate public education to all children with disabilities. As a result of this law, the budget for our special education programs has increased exponentially. In addition, there have been increased requirements for all students as mandated by No Child Left Behind and recent revisions to the requirement of response to intervention law. Parents of children with special needs do their research before they send their children to school. They want their children to attend a school with a solid special education program where certified faculty work to the best of their ability so that these students can reap the benefits of a good education. Cape Elizabeth High School has become one of these schools. We want children with special needs to make the most of the resources offered to them. One of the arguments for the budget cut is declining enrollment in our regular education. However, there is another population within our school that is increasing. Next year, two new students with special needs will be entering the high school. Their expenses combined will come to $150,000. These are not optional. If we want to continue receiving federal funds, we need to pay these mandated expenses. Town councillors should consider these non-negotiable expenses when claiming that school enrollment is falling and costs should be decreasing as well. The rejection of the school board's 6% budget increase unfairly impacts every student in our school. I urge you to take all of this into account and vote no on a 4.6% budget increase. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Andrew Pizzullo and I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. And Firstly, I really wanted to thank um, the school, the school board, the town council, and the taxpayers for giving me one of the best educations in the state of Maine. I've had passionate teachers and enga uh, passionate, engaging teachers, very small class sizes, and adult and peer tutoring that rivals programs offered by private institutions. My school community has challenged me to develop my skills and intellect by giving me ample opportunity to use my strengths to help others. I can speak well with adults, write proficiently, and have been given confidence to defend my ideas and to fight for what is right. 
I owe these developing strengths to my school. But it is very sad to me that I have come here tonight to confront, confront and address those who have helped me to succeed. My education uh, is not really in jeopardy. In about one year, I'll be gone. And, but, however, I have a sister, Anna, and she'll be a freshman next year. And I feel it's really an obligation as, as a brother to help her and those behind her to experience what I have. If the current budget proposals pass, budget proposal passes, she will enter a drastically different school than I did three years ago. She'll not be able to utilize the Achievement Center for SAT preparation and writing conferences. She'll not be able to go to the Mac Lab and create music, produce movies, or format photos. She will not be able to attend speech and debate meets and learn how to do what I'm doing right now. These are just a few of the things on the chopping block this year. But what about next year and the year after that? With gas prices rising and health care benefits continuing to rise at three times the rate of inflation, it's inevitable that we will be confronted with this problem year after year. And my sister Anna will no longer be getting one of the best educations in the state of Maine. Sadly, our public school, the great equalizer it was intended to be, will become a limiting factor in the lives of your kids, my friends, and the youth of our future. When this school ceases to be innovative, and the dynamic institution we had envisioned, the people will, people will stop coming here and property values will plummet. If we continue on this reckless path, you'll see a larger demographic trend toward public school abandonment. We as students are unwilling to remain apathetic any longer. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ginger Raspiller. I'm the Achievement Center Coordinator, and I live at 150 Spring Street, Portland, Maine. I'm concerned about many of the budget cuts, but this evening I'm going to be addressing the elimination of the full-time English teacher position in the Achievement Center, as Peter so eloquently already outlined. Since the center opened in 2005, one of the key services that we provide is writing support. The service impacts the greatest number of students freshmen through seniors, all course levels, and across the curriculum. The center also builds a four-year relationship with our students. Students can come to the center during study halls and after school to work on any writing assignment. We also provide one-on-one -on -one support through what we call our writing conferences. In a conference, a student is able to develop a thesis, formulate an outline, review content, but basically discuss every aspect of producing excellent writing. Students learn to self-edit, and it reinforces the concept that writing is a process. When the center opened, we had less than a full-time English teacher in the center. During the busiest times, we were unable to accommodate all of the conference needs. Finally, this year, we have been able to accommodate students even during the busiest times. And we have expanded our services to include prep for the language arts section of the SAT. High stakes exams are important to the individual student but to our school as well. For students, college admission and scholarships are on the line. As a high school, one of the metrics of our success is the performance of our students on the SAT exam. This fall, Dr. Melanson launched a pilot program to assist students with the SAT. Students in the program reported feeling more confident, well prepared. Students who were retaking the exam showed improved scores, some significantly. SAT courses are expensive and not everyone can afford them. We believe that this is an excellent way to leverage Dr. Melanson's time. The center also supports seniors with their all-important college essay. Many students take the opportunity to write and rewrite that all-important essay until they are comfortable that it reflects who they are as individuals. <clears throat> students graduating are finding it more difficult and more competitive to get into the colleges and universities of their choice. Scholarships and loans are more difficult to come by. From my view, the center, especially the writing support, is a smart investment in our kids and their future. I want to be very clear. Eliminating the English teacher position in the Achievement Center will eliminate our writing support program. So I urge the members of this community, the taxpayers of this community, to vote no on the 4.6% budget. It's too low. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Janessa DeBerry, 3 Seal Cove Lane. 
and uh, I'm chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission and I'm here tonight because I'm concerned that the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission budget is going to be cut um, and I would like you to reconsider that. Um, the Arts Commission are, were seven commissioner volunteer citizens serving our community. Six of us have been appointed in the last year. Uh, the mission of the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission is to enhance and enliven the community by promoting awareness, involvement, understanding, and access to the arts, including visual arts, music, dance, photography, writing, theater, film, and video. We, the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission volunteers, um, manage, maintain, attend, and chaperone Thomas Memorial Library Gallery art exhibits throughout the year. The sales from these exhibits generate income to the town. We also commission funded the purchase of four artists designed and constructed new easels for the Cape Elizabeth Community Center Art Studio. We fund the Thomas Memorial Library membership, family membership passes. The commission funds annual family museum passes to the Portland Museum of Art the Children's Museum of Maine, the Farnsworth Museum, Rockland Campus locations, including the Wyeth Center, the Homestead House, the Library, and the Olson House in Cushing, Maine. We also have an arts grant program. The Commission funds arts awards to local Cape Elizabeth artists resulting in gallery exhibits. We just held a Seniors in Cape Elizabeth, a photographic and written documentary um, exhibit at the library. With the next one coming up is on Shady Hill Horse Farm. It's a four-season photographic documentary, um, and that exhibit will open in December. We also um, maintain and record the town arts collection. We serve as a clearinghouse for local art activities by creating programs that bring vibrancy and energy to our local community culture throughout the arts. I do have a couple of questions. Um, if there is no budget for the Arts Commission, will the Commission disband? What are your plans for us if we have no budget? If there is no budget and the Commission will continue, will we be able to fundraise to support the events that we've put on? Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Clara Cohan, and I live at 15 Beach Bluff Terrace. And I have previously submitted a letter to each of you expressing my objection to the 100% cut to the Cape Elizabeth Art Commission. In that letter, I spoke of my appreciation for the Art Commission to assist local artists through their grant and special projects giving and how they build respect and support for the arts in this community. The money that the Commission is asking for goes right back into the community. I am a recipient of one of the special funds, uh, special projects funding I received uh, $500 to build four specially designed easels for the Cape Elizabeth Community Center. That $500 that I received was put back into paying my property taxes and the community studio benefited by gaining functional equipment. I began writing this letter with the intent to save the commission from the 100% cut. I would spent time looking through the school budget at what was being cut and the cost of other items on that budget. Adding to the information that I know about the larger global issues facing us now and in the future, I saw a bigger picture emerge. I believe that cutting the Arts Commission budget by 100% is not the solution to our budget problems. More so, I feel that as a society, we are faced with making a huge paradigm shift to adjust to the changing economic, energy, educational environment that our children are entering into. As an artist, I am very far thinking. I know often decisions are made on a, just a brief scale and not thinking way down the road. Looking over the budget, I feel that the, this community and other communities, that sports gets a disproportionate amount of town dollars. I know that there are cuts to the athletic budget for 2009, but when I look at the total numbers from the estimated 2000 year, which is $462,664, and the 2009 budget of $4,907,000, there is still an increase of almost $32,000. I'd just use this opportunity to ask everyone to turn their cell phones off. Thanks. 
Sorry, we're sorry about that. Thank you. And I also believe that the town is giving $150,000 towards the Bleacher Fund. Yes, sports keep our young people active, learning about working together as a team and how to face competition. But when it comes, when it comes down to what is really important for our children, a lot of that money could go towards allocation, towards the learning skills that these youth of today will need for their future. For a very long time, our American society has had the luxury of indulging in sports, driving big cars and wasting energy on many levels. Times have changed, our dollars only go so far. We have to decide the best use for our dollars. In Finland, where the brightest students in the world live, they have minimal to no sports programs. The students have a deep respect for reading, have a high self-esteem, and they develop in productive individuals in their society. Just as it's going to take a huge shift in our driving habits, moving to energy efficient vehicles, using solar energy, we also need to begin to shift from being such a sports driven society and spending so much money in this area. Excuse me, I'm going to have to ask you to... Okay, yes. So the bottom line question is do we keep our teachers and the programs that these students have been talking about tonight to inspire debate, speaking and writing skills, or do we put so much money into the sports and athletic? And uh, I just want to say that also that uh, we need to look at that 150,000 bleacher fund, that 3,000 of that dollars could go to the Arts Commission. Thank you very much. All right, Thanks. thank you. My name is Debbie Fisher, and I live at Nine High Bluff Road. I plan to vote no on June 10th because I do not support the 4.6% budget increase. I believe the figure is too low. I believe that the members of the school board are the experts when it comes to knowing what it takes to best educate our children. And based on their discussions with the administration, they recommend the 6% budget increase. This is not extravagant. It attempts to try to gain a little ground from the three years of the underfunding the schools had to endure due to the misguided tax cap and to cover increased utility bills, increased fuel costs for the buses, and increases in teachers' salaries. The Town Council has decided to ignore our experts' recommendations and instead proposed a 4.6% budget. We all know the valuable staff and programs that will be cut. Unfortunately, the 4.6% budget sends the signal loud and clear that we no longer value excellence in education. CAPE does not have the commercial tax base that our peer communities like Falmouth and Yarmouth can rely on. As a community, we have made the decision to limit commercial development. So be it. It is therefore imperative that our property values remain strong, and the way to maintain strong property values is to support excellence in education. Because if we don't, the word will get around that CAPE's priorities have shifted. New families will settle in our neighboring communities that follow their experts' advice to support a dynamic approach to education. Slowly but surely, our property values will decline and the downward spiral will make it difficult for us to fund all important town priorities. It bears repeating that if we as a town make the decision not to encourage commercial development, then the most important thing that we can do to maintain our property values is to support excellence in the schools. You as a council work hard and shoulder a lot of responsibility. Everyone in this chamber appreciates the time commitment that you have made. But if you continue to dig in your heels, if you ignore the constituents here tonight, if you really feel that the $264,000 gap between the 4.6 and the 6% uh, budget, this difference of $264,000, which is $5 a month, 13 cents a day, is worth all the divis divis divisiveness and contentiousness that is swirling around town today, then sadly, I believe your legacy will be the council that has undermined the tradition of excellence in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Lewaldi. I live at 33 Trendy Road. I have a seven-year-old and nine-year-old in Pond Cove. And I appreciate all that you here tonight and the town um, school board also brings to the democratic process. And that process is what brings me here tonight. I've attended um, some meetings. I've been following the events regarding the budget over the course of the year. And what is not clear to me, in which I hope maybe you collectively or individually could clarify in the upcoming um, Cape Courier, is the basis for your rationale for not presenting the school board's 6% um, budget to 
the town of Cape Elizabeth to vote on. They are the ones that have been entrusted with the responsibility based on their expertise and their time and their consultation with you. I appreciate that collaborative process to put forward a budget that they feel balances the demands of the fiscal picture that Mr. Rowe painted um, so well at the beginning, as well as our commitment as a town to our education. So ultimately that responsibility based on the school consolidation law is for us as a community to vote on the budget collectively. So if you could please explain publicly in the Courier or in another format why you chose not to put forward the school board's budget as, and your own, I would greatly appreciate it. If ultimately we as a community reject the 6%, then so be it. But why can't we, again, based on the work that the school board has given and the thought they have given to that, why can't we decide for ourselves? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sean Abernethy, and I recently moved to Cape Elizabeth uh, just this past September. I came from a school on Cape Cod that was double the size of Cape Elizabeth. It was 1,100 kids. That's just about the whole district here. And I was not offered a lot of the opportunities I have here. And when I first moved here, I actually did a little poorly due to the fact I didn't know how to utilize the resources that I was given. And since I have been here for a while and people have shown me um, how to use things like the Achievement Center, the SAT prep, the writing conferences, the Mac Lab and the technology that that offers, the clubs, the extracurriculars, I've actually done significantly better in um, all of my classes. And as a junior, it's, you know, the important year for me and as this year, the budget is what it is, but next year, I will need to write that all-important college acceptance paper, and I will need to write papers and write for many things that are important later on in life. And I want to ensure my place in college just as much as the seniors had that opportunity this year. And by cutting the budget, you're cramping that opportunity for people that have been here for years. I've improved just by being here nine months, and I think that that's really important. I know I'm not long, but thank you. Thank you. My name is Tim Williamson, and I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, <coughs> as well as my fellow classmates. I'm here to speak about a very important topic um, to me in the high school, which is the full-time English teacher position in the writing section of the Achievement Center, Dr. Melanson. Um, about three weeks before the SAT test, I rushed into the Achievement Center very frantic, very unprepared, feeling very flustered um, because my guidance counselor was telling me that I had three weeks until the SAT and I had done none preparation. And Dr. Melanson quickly calmed me down and told me that she could work with me one-on-one -on -one, and I, I met with her every day for three weeks, one-on-one. Um, -on -one. <laughs> And it gave me that personal attention that I needed that I couldn't get from a regular SAT class. Um, I learn better when I'm being instructed one-on-one. -on -one. Also, I, I do not have the financial support to pay for an SAT class. And so it was free of charge, uh, and it was during school. So it did not require any time commitment outside of school. And I believe, not getting the scores back yet, but I believe that that SAT preparation that I've done with her has drastically changed my scores to what they would have been quite... Frankly, I would not want to see what they would have been without her help. <laughs> and um, I also want to mention the writing conferences that I have done with her with the past three years. Um, and I did not utilize them very, um, I did not do many writing conferences my freshman year, if any. Sophomore year, I started to do them more, and my grades started going up in both history and English. I didn't need them in math and science. But um, this year, I, very, I utilized them very much, and... Um, the junior research paper in English, which is a very big paper, probably one of the most important, um, I had an original copy that received a grade of a B, a 90, and um, after one conference with her that was scheduled for half an hour, that ended up going about an hour and 15 minutes, <laughs> um, ended up being a final grade of 98 with her help. And so I feel that my academics will suffer without her position in the Achievement Center. And that the availability that she presents herself in the Achievement Center will not be, avail will not be available 
if next year she has declined that position. Um, I believe that the academics and opinions of even one student should hold enough importance to keep Dr. Melanson's position in the writing section in the Achievement Center because each student's achievement should matter. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hannah Jones. I live at 5 Wilton Lane. I have a daughter who's a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School, and I've been teaching at Cape Elizabeth High School for 12 years. I'm a hot commodity. I'm a mid-career professional. I have a master's degree, which Cape Elizabeth High School or the Cape Elizabeth School System paid for. I have won a national presidential award for being an outstanding teacher. I'm a published writer. I have a lot of benefits to bring to my position. I teach in the high school English department, and I also spend one period a day at the Achievement Center, where I am a pale second to Lisa Melanson. <laughs> and you're losing me. Tomorrow, um, Mr. Hawkins will be reading my letter of resignation to the school board. I remember telling Mr. Backer two years ago at a meeting very much like this, but at the high school library, that you would be losing excellent mid-career professionals if you continued to go down the path of cutting and cutting and cutting our school budget. Now I see it actually happening, not just to me, but to some of my colleagues. Some of us are leaving this year. Some of us are starting to read the want ads. It devastates me. I'm a property taxpayer. I have a house in town, which I'm at some point going to have to sell. And I'm deeply concerned that the value of living in Cape Elizabeth is being hacked away at year after year by cutting out the lifeblood of our community, and that's our schools. This may sound like hyperbole, but it's not. When I came here 12 years ago, I was the youngest member of my department by 20 years. I was a 29-year-old teacher, and I wasn't very good at it yet. It takes a long time to become an excellent teacher. You've helped me to do so. You've provided me a nurturing environment You've paid for my education. You've given me reasonable class sizes and wonderful, <coughs> wonderful children to work with. And I'm so grateful. But I have a daughter now who's going off to college, and I can't afford to stay. At my new job, I'll be making more money, 40% more. I'll have smaller class sizes. I'm going into a school system that values writing and provides writing instruction to their students and beyond the regular English curriculum. I can't afford to let that opportunity pass me by. Gone are the days when school marms came into buildings, stayed with local families, you know, loaded up the coal stove or the wood stove and put in a long day for peanuts. We just don't do it anymore. And I'm sorry, I love this community passionately and I've given hours and hours of my life to it. But I will not stay in a place that doesn't value me and doesn't value my colleagues. So I sincerely hope that as you're making a decision about, what is it, 18 cents a day for the median household, that you will have the courage to say, I know gas is more expensive. I know groceries are more expensive. I know that people are having a hard time, but we have made a choice to be to a one-town district with no business space, and we're going to have to pay for what we really believe in. Thank you. I'm still going to read what I have here, but if, if these articulate students aren't enough to convince you of the value of a Cape Elizabeth education, I don't know what else would be, because I'm incredibly impressed. I'm Gail Atkins, a citizen of Cape Elizabeth, residing on Shore Road. I have had children in the Cape Elizabeth school system for so long that I remember when they eliminated home economics from the high school curriculum. <laughs> I also remember a while back when the high school was begging for $30,000 to enable them to keep a few of their programs, one of which was Latin. That was the same year that the town spent, I believe, about $20,000 for the granite out in front of the police station. I remember the impassioned but fruitless pleas of the high school students 
do not cut the creative writing elective. Here we are again begging for more money for the school system. Always the response is the same. The town doesn't have the money and doesn't want to increase taxes. Yet, the town council has authorized a study for building a five-foot sidewalk with a five-foot buffer between the sidewalk and the road pavement from the town center to Fort Williams. Where will the money come from to build this sidewalk and pay the expenses such as eminent domain takings? But more importantly, where will the money come from to maintain it? The sidewalk will need to be shoveled in the winter and the buffer strip will need to be maintained and mowed. If the town currently does not have the funds to support what it already has, namely our schools, how can we realistically and in good conscience build something that will require maintenance funds year after year after year? We built the schools, we need to fund them. Every year the school budget is gone through with a fine tooth comb, first by the school administration, then the school board, and then the town council. When the time comes for the public hearing on the sidewalk, will we have the same assurance that the budget has been gone over with a fine tooth comb, or will we be surprised, like I think many of us were surprised, with the needless design and expense of the granite across the street? Now, I know this meeting is not about the sidewalk, but it is about money. As all fiscally responsible people know, you can't make decisions in a vacuum. A family might have to consider taking a vacation versus a new roof for their home. The town council needs to also view one town expense versus another town expense. Somehow, the town always has funds for some things, but not for the schools. I, for one, would rather see my tax dollars go toward the education and future of over 1,500 students year after year than towards the upkeep of a frivolous sidewalk to be used by a few. The new referendum makes this issue even more confusing. Town residents not actively involved in the schools will assume that because the town council has approved the dollar figure being voted on, it must be adequate. Yeah. It will only be adequate Ask if it meets the 6% needed by the schools. Please consider investing our tax dollars in improving what we already have, Thank namely you. our schools for our children. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Jana Zimmerman. I'm at 81 Oakhurst Road. I have a fifth grader. Um, born in 1997. I'll give you a reason for that in a minute. And um, I'm at the right meeting this time on the right date. And I've still got the same books. And I thought I would, um, I brought these books last year, I'm pretty sure. Um, all of these books except one, this one, um, which is in lovely shape. These were all, mostly all put in circulation at our schools, in the middle school, before my child was born. Now, a quarter, my favorite, you know, I brought this one last year, you may remember it. Um, this one is about a quarter of a century old. It's a lot older than my daughter. I am hoping by the time my child gets to this grade that this is not the textbook she's going to face. I'm hoping you guys will kind of see that Continual cutting of the school budget is going to get us in trouble. This book was um, published in 1983. This one was the Voyager 2. It was, going to, it was expecting Voyager 2 to go past Uranus in 1986. Now, the question in this lovely book is that it asks the students to think, to think about what Voyager's probes and adventures might be. You know, Mr. Conley loves the test scores that we're getting. He's getting lots of data, and I love that he's getting lots of data. Because, because there's not been any interim textbook cycle since this lovely book, and no sequel, as I said last year, same book, same story, our students cannot rely on this text to answer questions about science related to this. Now, you may have predicted I'd find a way to tie this into test scores, because I'm a big fan of data. But Mr. Conley and our teachers beat me to it. They did not require the sophisticated statistics that a neuropsychologist like me might use. They instead knew why the NWEA test results revealed a weakness in the area of informational text among students equipped with outdated textbooks. It was one of those duh moments and I bet Mr. Conley used his um, that was easy button. He loves using that button. 
It didn't surprise, I mean, I'm sorry, it, it surprised me and it shocked me to learn that we have now deferred, we're on deferment 11 of our textbook cycle. We're supposed to be an excellent school district. Jana, I have to ask you to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Darn, then I can't well, tell you about migrants, math teaching, and how this is so similar. I think we got I it do. last year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next year I'll be back. Um, the, um, <laughs> what I would like to say to you is Jenna, let the town we, vote on 6% and let us decide. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Rebecca Millett. I live at 12 Wombeck Road, and I serve on the school board but I'm here um, as an individual of that school board. I'm not speaking on the board's behalf. Um, I want to thank you all for the time that you give in service of Cape Elizabeth and for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And I wanted to address one issue in particular. There has been a lot of discussion during budget deliberations around enrollment, so I'm hoping to address some of those issues tonight. As I understand it, the concern is that there hasn't been a decline in spending or teachers in relation to a declining enrollment. First, I would like to point out that there is not a one-for-one -one correlation between regular ed classroom teacher expenses and lower enrollment. There is a threshold that has to be met in terms of class size in order to reduce staffing in a particular grade. So while there may have been a reduction of students over the past several years, it has been spread out over a number of years and over 12 grades and does not immediately translate to teacher reductions. Where the threshold has been experienced, staffing has been reduced. For example, last year, second grade was reduced by one teacher, and this year, first grade will be reduced by one teacher due to enrollment. In addition, it's important to remember that fixed expenses do not decline with enrollment such as heating, building maintenance, transportation, and administration. Finally, expenses have not dropped in direct correlation because of our, our society's expectation that schools will serve as a means to solving all of our problems, from substance abuse to the achievement gap, making sure that every child progresses and that no child will be left behind, regardless of their individual needs and learning style and will provide students with the skills necessary to succeed in our global economy. As a result, our schools have put into place programs to address these expectations, and this is reflected in our teacher numbers. In 2000-2001, we had 112 regular classroom teachers. In this year, we had 114. That's a two-classroom teacher increase. For teachers in intervention and support, which addresses those issues that I talked about that people now expect schools to solve, we went from four and a half teachers in 2000-2001 to 13.4. Okay, so that is where the increase was experienced. Ed techs, in 2000-2001, for regular ed instruction, it was 15.67. This year, it's 14.95. It's gone down. Special education ed text went from 22.7 to 29. So the big increase is in the area of intervention, remediation, and prevention. Like our elementary school reading recovery teachers, math lab teacher, achievement center teachers, etc. This reflects our country's promise that all children will be taught. You can see that our regular instruction teachers, ed techs, I'm sorry, have actually decreased while special education has gone up. Overall, yes, our special education population is slightly down, but the depths of these children's issues are much deeper and require much more intensive services, which we are required by law to provide or pay for if the children are to be placed out of district, which can run up to $100,000 per child. That is much more expensive than the cost we incur when we provide education in our schools. So thank you very much, and I hope that that was helpful. Thank you, Rebecca. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Rosie Wember. I am a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School and I live on 21 Angel Point Road. Our town, Cape Elizabeth, is defined by our school system. Our state and our country look to Cape Elizabeth schools as leaders in academics. We have produced students with perfect SAT scores, 
We have students who are world-class athletes. We have students who win nationally recognized art awards. The reason the Cables with Schools produce such outstanding humans is a direct result of the nourishment provided by our community. The members of this town have spent time volunteering in the libraries. They have donated resources for the SBA's program for students with special needs. The members of our community have given money to the Cables with Education Foundation to provide the high school with perhaps its most valuable asset, the Achievement Center. We cannot stop now. If our town approves only a 4.6 budget increase, the time and money given to our schools by our town will go to waste. The programs will allow, which allow our students to succeed will disappear. Above all, the caring, passionate teachers who open windows of knowledge and understanding to our friends, siblings, and children will lose their jobs. Everything that Cable is with is known, loved, and admired for will fade away. A raise in the budget would mean negligible raise in taxes for our citizens. People have proved not only over the past decades, but here tonight, that they are willing to pay 45 extra dollars a year. We need to continue to offer our programs and resources that will be cut from the budget. For the benefit of the teachers, the students, and the town, we need to keep Cape Elizabeth functioning at its highest level. Please vote no on June 7th to appeal the budget as proposed by town council. It is too low for our schools. Please show us, the students, everyone who has showed up here tonight, that you care and continue to care. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just correct that election day is June 10th. June Good evening. My name is Anna Tranthalia, and I live at 6 Evergreen Circle. I have been a student in this district for 13 years. I am a second semester senior with only four short days of school left. This pending decision regarding school funding does not affect me personally. However, I feel a commitment to this town and to my educators who, in addition to their responsibilities throughout the school day, supported activities that greatly expanded my education. For example, Mrs. McNulty has donated hundreds of hours of her time in order to create and advise the World Affairs Council. More than 50 students have gone to model United Nations conferences because of her willingness and dedication to this new club. <coughs> Mr. Lee has taken time up out of his extremely busy schedule to edit my papers that are not even for his classes. These are a few examples where teachers have gone above and beyond to help me and my fellow classmates. Therefore, it is disheartening for me, as well as many of the other students present tonight, to witness the staff and faculty in the high school become frustrated and disillusioned with the funding levels and overall attitude this town council has demonstrated in their dealings with the school budget. Many teachers gave up lucrative careers to share their knowledge with CAPE students. Many teachers have advanced degrees and extensive experience in their respective fields. Much of the success of our school system is based upon the quality of our teachers. When lean school budgets are further slashed by town council actions, it should be obvious that teachers and staff wonder why the town does not value their service and dedication. At what point do these disillusioned teachers become teachers looking for new jobs? The opportunities I have had as a student are in jeopardy for the current students within this district. Their actions directly affect the quality of education in the school system. It is obvious sitting in the classroom that teachers are concerned whether they will have a job next year. We are all aware that these are difficult economic times. However, it appears when it comes to municipal budgets that the school department has taken an unhealthy hit four years in a row. I implore you to fund the schools as the high-performing district that it is. Anything less affects the quality of education, is insulting to our teachers and staff, and detrimental to our, for our youngest citizens. I will be voting no on June 10th, as will a number of my classmates, for it is a fitting way to thank our educators who have given us so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Hi, my name is Peter Carey. I'm, I'm not a high school student. Um, <laughs> so you need to give us your address. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I live at 36 Brentwood Road along with my wife and two children, a uh, junior in high school and a seventh grader. We moved here 14 years ago in part because of the pool, in very large part because of the school system. Uh, both children have received an absolutely wonderful education, thanks in large part to the many efforts of the teachers, the administrators, the school board members, the town counselors, the volunteers, and coaches. Um, my brother has moved here. His kids have graduated from the high school. My sister has bought a house here. She hasn't moved here yet, but she's planning on it. Uh, 
I respect the time and dedication that all of you have applied in your roles as town councilors. I've also welcomed the opportunity that I've had to speak to some of you personally about the school budget issues. I respectfully disagree with your recommendation to present a 4.6% school budget increase to the town for a public vote on June 10th. Uh, I believe we as a town should support the 6% budget presented by our superintendent and recommended by the school board. I plan to vote no on the budget on June 10th, and I have a very boring procedural point, which really is the only reason I'm up here. I would urge you, if you can, on the ballot, to have a provision that would allow us to say why we are voting no. I'd like it for two reasons. One is, this is the first time that we're going to get a chance to gauge the public's reaction to a school budget, I believe. I'm, it's the first time in an awful long time. Number two, I believe it costs $5,000 per election. If we can save that money, if this vote budget is voted down, I think you and we all should know why. So I would urge you, if you have the power to, to make sure on that ballot is a chance for us to vote or to indicate why we're voting for or against the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, council members. My name is Lisa Melanson. I live at 3 Rockwall Lane. I have three children in the Cape schools, uh, one in Pond Cove, one in the middle school, and one in the high school. And as you've heard, uh, my position in the Achievement Center has been eliminated for the coming year um, because the town council indicated it would reject uh, the school board's recommended 6% budget. As a parent as an ed and as an educator, I believe if we fail to fund the schools adequately, our public schools will deteriorate. Excellent teachers will go elsewhere. Indeed, they have already begun to do so. Hannah Jones is a dedicated and masterful teacher. Community spirit will decline. People who can afford to send their children to private school will do so. And we will become a town divided between the haves and have-nots. When we shortchange our schools, we sacrifice the ability of our students to achieve at the highest possible level. <coughs> Counselors, I urge you to change your vote. And actually, I was heartened by the discussion of the flagpole because I saw flexibility in your minds and a willingness to adapt to what you heard. Uh, so please consider what you've heard tonight and be persuaded by it. Please consider funding the 6% budget. If not, I urge voters on June 10th to uh, reject the 4.6 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening. My name is Steve Lavallee, and I'm 57 Brentwood Road, Cape Elizabeth. I have uh, a fourth grade, an eighth grade, and a 10th grade student. Uh, I was not planning on speaking. First of all, thank you for all your time and efforts. You guys give a lot of time, and I uh, appreciate that a lot. I was not planning on speaking. But when I heard uh, Hannah Jones, whom I don't know, say that she's leaving um, in possibly or primarily for a 40% pay increase, um, I think that is the first uh, and will not be the last that, that we'll hear about that. Um, I work in Yarmouth, Maine. I've worked in Falmouth. Um, we do not have the nicest bricks and mortar schools in our town, but we do have outstanding teachers and outstanding people in those schools. We need to um, recognize that and pay, pay for that. I urge you to reconsider the 6% uh, budget that was presented by the school board. I'll say Peter his $5,000 and we won't have to go to a new election. Um, I was in college admissions uh, years ago in a selective school uh, outside of Maine. I had two days to visit high schools in Maine and certainly Cape Elizabeth was one that I visited. Um, I think we're going to rest on our laurels. I think we have for the last couple of years, and I think we're, it, this is a, uh, possibly a trend that we're setting where other towns that we compete with um, are not and are going forward. I've been in the relocation and, and home financing business for over 20 years, and I've never had an out-of-state person or a local person that's moving um, to a different town say, geez, I'm picking this town because it's lower taxes. I've heard the number one reason that I've heard from people all over this country moving to Maine, whether they pick, whatever town they pick is the school system, um, if they have children. So if we can, by any um, stretch of the imagination, reconsider and go for the 6%, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, I agree and um, encourage people to vote no on uh, the June 10th election. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. 
Hi, my name is Keelan Pomeroy, and I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. I just wanted to say that I consider myself very fortunate to have grown up in this community and to attend it, um, this school system. I've received a brilliant education, and um, I think that the atmosphere of the school and the care and support shown to me by all my teachers has encouraged me to really work hard and strive to realize my full potential. Um, I've taken advantage of a lot of the opportunities offered to the students at Cape Elizabeth High School, and I think that these should be offered for students to come as well. I think that our school is what makes our community strong, and I don't think we should jeopardize that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Hellman. I live at 22 Aquarium Brook Drive, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I, I cut this down to three pages since everybody's made all my points. Uh, first time I've shortened my speech in a long time. I have four or five points to make. First is a, is a principle of democratic theory. Uh, a fundamental principle about democracy is ruled by the majority. Um, this town has made it very clear, the majority of towns made it very clear on at least two, I believe three occasions in voting against uh, Tabor, uh, Pulaski, that we do not want artificial CPI caps in this town. I don't know how much, how often or how much more clear we can make that. It's overwhelmingly voted against by a supermajority of over 60 percent. Yet this budget is a CPI cap. So by, if you pass it, you are violating, violating a fundamental principle of democracy, and that is ruled by the majority. While I understand Jim's comment, it's, it's important to be sensitive to all the needs of the town. And if one can do that, great. But you can't do that in violation of the principle that we are ruled by a majority of our citizens. Secondly, there is a, an important principle of good government's government, and that is deference to the agency with the specialized expertise, which is the school board. That point has been made repeatedly. I want to add one thing, and that is, in the past, you've had to uh, exercise oversight. It's in the town charter. You had to exercise some oversight of what the school board did. That is no longer true. Now the decision on school budgets being made by the voters is called direct democracy. You don't have to exercise that duty anymore. did it well in the past, but you don't have to do it anymore. We now have that right, and we want to exercise it. Um, one comment I heard in, in these um, various hearings is the concern for the elderly on fixed income. It's a legitimate concern. However, I think it's simply an incorrect concern, and it's based on a, a limited number of emails and communications. I think the elderly uh, fixed income, as well as other people, as well as everybody in this room that's graduated from high school, receives the benefits of a publicly funded education. And as a result, uh, I have the privilege of now fund, uh, of funding the public education of the generations behind me. That is what our elderly, elderly on fixed income, uh, are now being faced. Some elderly senior citizens then paid for their education. It's their turn now to pay it forward. I believe that, that the generation that's been referred to as the greatest generation that went through great, the Great Depression and World War II would never turn their back on the children of this town by voting not to give them what they receive themselves, which is a great public education funded by others. I simply do not believe it, nor should you. Um, lastly, well, two points. Every decision inevitably is a cost-benefit analysis. You, 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 can't, you don't have money to pay for everything. What is the cost-benefit analysis in this case? One, the cost of doing this is um, about 13 and a half cents a day per medium average household. The benefit is great. Uh, wonderful education for our, our students. Twist the prism a bit. Look at it the other way. What's the cost? The cost is... Um, David? I'm done? I have to Okay. I'm going to end it on a simple point. Um, if you, I want you to send out a... Six, I would prefer it if you send out a 6% budget. That way we'll end the divisiveness in this town once and for all. If we vote yes, you know we want to to spend that kind of money. If we vote no, you know we don't. Do it the other way, we'll, we'll be here forever trying to figure out which it is. Thank so that's you, David. 6% so we know. Thanks. Thank you, Marianne. Good morning. My name is Trish Brigham, and I live at 34 Rockcrest Drive. I want to thank you for your time and service to the community. 
I support a budget for the school which is higher than 4.6% figure which your finance committee compromised on and is recommending for the town council approval. If you opt to send this budget to the voters, I will vote no. I'd also like to make another comment this evening related to the school and the municipal budgets. Recently, you approved a comprehensive plan for our community. I applaud your efforts and those of the comprehensive plan committee for their work. The plan clearly indicates what the townspeople of Cape value, open space, parks and recreational opportunities, rural town character, and a strong school system. I'd like to propose that there be some sort of follow-up, a plan B, if you will, or a part B, if you will, to the plan, which engages the public in a dialogue on how we can pay for what we want. In fact, the things that we most value have negative budget implications. They all cost money, and they generate little if no tax revenue. This is not highly enlightening news. I think people are aware of this and understand the need for tax increases to maintain the community assets, which they have come to expect and appreciate. But maybe all are not. That's the importance of community discussion. Every year we find ourselves in the same place, debating which tax rate is most palatable for the voters, assessing which needs simply cannot be put off for another year. Can we not consider ways to expand and diversify our revenue stream so that we can meet the goals of the comprehensive plan, get out of this conundrum, pave the roads which need repaving, support an arts commission, and properly maintain our school system? I would hope that with your leadership, we can find a way to accomplish this. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Hi, my name is Mary Townsend, and I live at 5 Pearl Street. And thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Um, and I just want to say how inspired I was by the students tonight. Um, I did not plan on speaking, um, but it has just been an honor to listen to them and their teachers speak. And it is my honor to have taken part in paying for part of their education and having my property taxes raised time and time again to fund their education. And um, personally, I think 6% is too low for the schools this year, um, given the fact that we have operated under a very stringent tax cap, um, a misguided tax cap, in my opinion, for the last three years. Um, so I would ask you, given all of the good reasons um, that you have heard tonight, um, to reconsider your number. And I would ask you if you could reconsider that number before you make your vote on May 30th. So perhaps we're taking a vote on a higher number. Um, I think the cost to um, the individual is not so high that I would be um, inclined to um, disagree with the 6%. It's for the median household or the ho median homeowner. We're talking about four dollars and sixteen cents per month, um, and that impact doesn't really take into account the property tax abatements that roughly twenty to twenty-five percent of um, homeowners receive for property tax relief. Um, I feel like it's important that all Cape residents um, believe in their schools, and it's a common responsibility and a top priority. We all received the benefits of a public education, and the cost was funded not just by citizens who had um, children in school. Um, it was funded in part by citizens who were on fixed in incomes and citizens that had no children in school. Um, it's our public duty and our civic, our civic privilege to pay back our community by providing them the same benefits that we received. Our future depends on it because the well-being of our community as well as the value of our properties is contingent upon preserving our public schools. Um, and since we have few businesses in this town and we value open space and free public parks, um, the burden to fund these is going to be on the homeowner. And that's a choice that we've made as a community. And so as a community, I would suggest that we come up with a solution to this um, and by adequately funding our schools we're affirming our commitment to students, teachers and administrators and we're providing them at the very least um, the basics and our support. Um, and most importantly the slight increase of 416 per month 
will provide essential funding that will equip Cape Elizabeth children with the tools necessary to thrive and excel in this, increasing, this um, increasingly global economy. Um, so, number one, I'd ask you to reconsider your number before you vote on May 30th. Um, and if you can't change your number, I will be voting no on June 10th because I think the budget is too low. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And um, just to clarify, um, our next meeting is the 27th, where we will be voting on the budget in order to comply with the town council. Sometime, with, that's right, the, the town charter, I'm sorry. Because the state law is inconsistent with the charter, sometime on or after May 31st, we will be voting on the school budget. So I just wanted to, and we have not decided that day yet. Um, we have some scheduling complications, but um, for the next vote, which will be on the municipal budget, um, will be the 27th. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dana Greer from Fort Dean Way. I'm going to keep this really simple because I was not intending to speak tonight. Um, but I got up because I was impressed with so many of the students that got up and spoke this evening. And I truly hope that my sixth and third graders have that same skill set when it comes time for their turn to speak in front of some of you maybe, um, and hopefully some <laughs> council members as well. I have to say, I, I went to the school board meeting um, where they voted on that 6% increase, and I was not happy at all. I think that 6% increase basically represents mandated benefit um, increases and increasing energy costs. I think that Superintendent Hawkins, the school board, and you as well, everybody has made a great effort on behalf of our schools, but I don't think that 6% gains us anything. I think it maintains for yet another year of what we currently have. And that's why I really feel strongly that a 4.6% 4 increase represents cuts that we will be feeling for years and years to come. I won't support it. To me, and, and please don't, economic times are tough. My husband's self-employed. We feel it in my household. But a 6% increase means to me one less takeout pizza a month. My family is willing to forego that. And we'll make sure it's when we buy in South Portland, not when we buy here in Cape. Um, I would encourage you to be as brave as these students were that spoke here tonight. I constantly hear at work, I work in health care, that change is good. Um, change your minds and let us vote on the 6% increase that the school board supported. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Trish Wasserman. I live at Three Running Tide Road in Cape. And first, thank you, all of you, for all that you do for our town, for all of us. And please know that whether or not we agree or disagree, I highly respect your thoughts, and I appreciate your time and effort in listening to all of us. Um, I'm here tonight because I truly believe that funding our schools at a low level is going to further erode and quite seriously even uh, delete basic services that we, we all call upon our school administrators and our teachers to provide our students. We ask them for this. I can think of no better investment for our town, our state, and our country than our children's education, um, our generation, all of us. We're going to be leaving them, our children, with pretty substantial financial, environmental, health care, and social burdens that are going to fall squarely on their shoulders sooner than we're ready to face. The problems we've created or allowed to evolve on our watch are local, national, and global. And I really believe it's our responsibility and within our means to provide our kids from Cape, from all households, from $100,000 homes to $1 million homes across the spectrum with great tools so that they can solve the problems we haven't been able to. And I think that the public education provides all of our citizens' children, whether they're wealthy or not so wealthy, with those means, much like our parents provided us and they themselves were provided. Now, for all those facing financial struggles in town, I'm all for tax relief for those who need it. And I think you especially are particularly poised to help us find ways, and creative ways, that we can allow people who've lived here for many decades 
to stay here and be part of our rich community and enrich our lives and our kids' lives. I think for those um, who are on fixed incomes, we need to look at creative financing that allows them to remain here as well. Can we expand our homestead exemptions? Can we freeze real estate taxes for individuals when they hit a certain benchmark age and are retired and on fixed incomes? I think we need to look at creative financial solutions, and I think you are all perfectly poised and well gifted to be able to do that, and I look to you to do that with our help. But the bottom line for me, living here and looking around in Cape, that my, my neighbors, who I love dearly, who are from all walks of life, retired, wealthy, not so wealthy, for our farming community, for all of those here, I still, still see a tremendous, tremendous number of us who can truly afford to fully fund our schools. We all need to make choices, and I really believe that our generation, having benefited from perhaps the highest quality public education, means of living in a beautiful community, having great health care, and being able to preserve our natural treasures and towns, now need to take the time and pass that baton on to our kids. We have to use our purchasing power, our energies, and our efforts for our schools because we are placing our children in a far more precarious position than the generation before it did for us. It's our time. We need to pony up, and a large segment of us in town truly can do it if we make the right choices, and we can do it in a way that protects those among us who we truly value who aren't able to. So please, please consider fully funding our schools. Thanks, Trish. Good evening. My name is Kevin Sweeney, 7 Phillip Road, Cape Elizabeth. As a former member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, I would like to say to you and to the school board, better you than me. <laughs> As you all know, when the original budget increase of 13.5% was announced, I challenged that most vehemently through emails to both you and to the school board since I am, in fact, someone who lives on a fixed, limited income. Anything above 2.4% becomes a multiple of the grandiose raise I received from the federal government this past January. However, since that time, the budget has been reduced by the school board to 6%. You, as is your right, have reduced that number to 4.6%. You have the right to do that. That is why we have the form of government we do. However, I would like to ask you to reconsider and allow the 6% budget to go forward to the voters. It is we, under the new circumstances of school consolidation, the state government has decided that this will go to the people regardless. Rather than spend money on election after election after election, the people will speak to you on June 10th whether or not they approve 6%. If they don't approve 6%, one might be able to assume that they would approve some lesser number. But in any event, that's why I'm here tonight. I'm not here to fight for a 6% budget. I am not here to condemn a 4.6% budget. It all means the same to me. The difference between the two, to me, is irrelevant. Whether it's 46 or 6%, I am going to be negatively impacted in my disposable income. But I do ask you, as someone who loves democracy, send it forward to the voters at the 6%. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Jenny Myers. I live at 96 Eastman Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And I am a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School. Why am I here? I only have four more days, and I'm out of Cape Elizabeth High School. But I'm here because I love my school. And I love the people I'm leaving behind. And when they were informed about the budget cut, you could just see the panic in their eyes, especially when it came to the Achievement Center, especially when it came to Ms. Melanson, who is an amazing woman. I went on a trip with her to Italy and Spain this April, which is another wonderful privilege she offers us 
every year. And I took the SATs my junior year and didn't do so well, especially in reading and writing. And I went back and got some tutoring and took them again, and my reading and writing skills went, my points went well over 100 points increase. And I would hate to see the people I love who I'm leaving behind this year to not be able to have that privilege that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sawyer Terrio. I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, thank you for letting me have this opportunity. I was definitely not planning on speaking tonight, but uh, when I heard Miss Hannah say that she's going to be resigning, I felt inclined to because uh, I have a brother who graduated in 2006. He's a junior. He will be a junior in college next year, sophomore now, and he still raves about Miss Hannah as one of the or the best English teachers that he's ever had. Uh, I think that seeing Miss Hannah go and seeing Dr. Melanson go are just two of the very beginning and very scary things that could be happening to Cape Elizabeth in the upcoming years, especially if it happens this year with the proposed 4.6 budget increase. Uh, and I'd also like to say that Dr. Melanson's position, which I can say I utilize the Achievement Center literally every single day. Uh, I have uh, writing conferences with Dr. Melanson frequently, but not uh, as often as I go in just to check and see how things are in the Achievement Center. But those are two of the most important things that have been the most important things to me in my high school career so far. Um, and to see them go next year would be devastating to me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dan Fishbein, Salisbury. I think our time is running out. When my wife and I moved here 13 years ago, Cape Elizabeth spent amongst the highest in towns in Cumberland County per student. That was one of the reasons we moved here. We just hadn't started a family yet, but we moved here for the schools. Now we spend amongst the lowest in Cumberland County. So you may think, you know, 4.6% or some of the increases of the past few years are increases, but other towns have been spending more than we have, and they've surpassed us. And what's been happening, each year we cut a few things. And bit by bit, we cut more and more, and we end up with a school system that is no longer being funded as one of the better school systems in the state. We cut, we, we, we don't buy textbooks, we go to pay for play for athletics, which you've, you've probably all seen in Portland was rejected as an outrage, a, a community with far, far less means than we have. And now we're talking about a series of other cuts. We, what we're talking about is a few dollars on the median home in taxes here and there. But our, the median home price in Cape Elizabeth is seventy-five dollars to $100,000 higher than the average home in other communities in Cumberland County. If we want to boil this down to the very selfish terms that we seem to have been uh, addressing here, then what we're saying is we'd rather save a few dollars a month in taxes and have it come back eventually to cost us seventy-five dollars or $100,000 in home equity. We're living on the tail of past investments. The teachers haven't left so far, although tonight you heard that that has started. The families that chose to live here because they valued educations and had potentially excellent students haven't moved away or haven't stopped moving here so far. That will start changing. It's already started to change. They'll move to Yarmouth. They'll move to Cumberland. They'll move into Scarborough when they move to Maine. The best teachers will, when they come to apply for jobs in Maine, will go to those systems. Their home prices will go up and ours will go down. This is the ultimate in, penny, in a series of penny-wise and pound-foolish decisions. I want to conclude also by just sharing an experience I had this weekend. Uh, my wife and I took our son Matthew to the National Elementary Chess Championships in Pittsburgh, and we just got back a few hours ago. 
We had numerous conversations with parents from other public school systems with far less means than ours who had sent their teams uh, to Pittsburgh at town expense. And they wondered why we only had a couple of kids there. And believe me, I'm not advocating that we do that. But we explained, well, that's out of the question. We have 15 to 20-year-old textbooks. And they looked at us and, well, I guess you come from a, a town that's not very well off. When we explained that we came from the wealthiest town in our state, we got heads shaking in disbelief. But one comment in particular I wanted to share with you. When we made that comment about 15 to 20-year-old textbooks, the gentleman said to us, well, some towns just don't value education. I hope that on June 10th, this community will prove that gentleman wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hi, my name is Shay Watson, and I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. And I don't pay taxes. I'm 16, so I can't speak on behalf of the property taxpayers in the town. But I can speak on behalf of all the students who reap the benefits of the money spent by those taxpayers. I can't imagine going to Cape Elizabeth High School without the help of teachers that are so moving teachers so passionate like Ms. Jones um, and Dr. Melanson. I think part of what makes Cape Elizabeth High School such a good school, such a school that people look at and view as an elite top school, especially in the state of Maine. Um, I just, I can't view myself going there without the help of people in the Achievement Center, and all the different clubs and activities that the students get the benefit of having. Um, next year I'll be a senior and I'll have to write the ever talked about uh, college letters um, and yeah, I'm nervous. I'm going to be applying to college who isn't, but I think that having positions like Dr. Melanson's and the Achievement Center help everyone. If you could see the look on panics in people's faces when they walk into that room. It's amazing how much happier they look when they walk out. Um, I think Ms. Jones is also a very passionate teacher who kids have loved and, you know, have been touched by over the years, and I think that there's so many other teachers like that in the school. And, the possibility of my brother, who's in seventh grade right now, going to a Cape Elizabeth High School and not, you know, reaping the benefits of teachers that are so um, touching, teachers that really do change lives. I feel like I came to Cape Elizabeth High School as a shy little freshman, and now I'll leave as a someone who's a lot more confident, and I'll be a senior, and I'll be able to say that I really appreciated every minute I had in Cape Elizabeth High School, and I really hope that my brother can say the same, and kids that will come to the high school in the future. I think it'd just be um, saddening to see such a great high school fall apart because um, people didn't want to spend an extra 13 cents a day. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would care to speak? Going once, going twice. Okay. I will close the public hearing. Thank you all for your participation. Um, we will go. Th I th I'll wait. I'll give this a minute to clear the room. I think we will take a one minute recess.
agenda. Um, but again, we appreciate those of you who um, came and spoke and those of you who came and watched and those of you who've decided to stay. We definitely appreciate. Okay, um, the first item on our agenda after the public hearing is item 70-2008 and that is the um, fiscal year 2009 proposed municipal budget. Jim, do you have a motion? I, well, let me say this. Um, Jim will be making a motion to table. And so if there's anyone who would like to comment on the municipal budget before he makes his motion to table, which is non-debatable. Okay, Jim. I, I just I'm want to sorry. say one thing for the, for the record. So that people know that the municipal budget increase is 3.37%. That's 3.37%. So I just want to make okay. sure people understand that it's far less than the 4.6 percent we were had recommended for the school budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, Jim, I think a motion would be in order. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chairman. I would like to move that we table adoption of the proposed fiscal year 2009 municipal budget, recommending $8,802,090 in expenditures, which, as Paul said, is an increase of $286,700, or 3.37%, uh, $3,450,500 in revenues from sources other than property tax, which is a decrease of $217,060, or 5.92%, with $5,351,590 to be borne by taxation, which is an increase of $503,760, or 10.39%, with a projected tax uh, rate of $4.04 .04 per thousand dollars of assessed valuation. Is there a second? Okay, all in favor? The 7 0. And we are tabling this um, municipal budget um, so that we can have the advantage of hearing from the public for the next um, couple of weeks, and we will meet again in public <coughs> meeting um, to adopt the budget at that time. And the next item on the agenda is item 71, which is the um, FY 2009 proposed education budget. Again, um, Jim, as finance chair, will be making a motion to table. But if anyone on the council would like to um, say anything before the motion to table, a tabling motion is undebatable. So um, if anyone would like to, Ann? Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a couple things that I would just like to clarify for the public who may be watching on TV or anybody in the audience. Um, I've become of, aware of several misconceptions that have been in the press and in several emails. I've had a number of questions um, about two subjects. Uh, one is the wording of the ballot question on June 10th, 2008, you know, the exact wording. And secondly, <coughs> excuse me, what happens uh, or what school budget goes into effect on July 1st, 2008, the new fiscal year 09, uh, when the new fiscal 09 starts, if the citizen vote on June 10th, 2008 fails. Um, I have a memo here from the Maine Municipal Association that I would like to share. I can pass it down that way. Oops, I'll keep one for myself. Um, and that addresses both these questions. It's plus some additional inf It also has some in additional information about when and how the town uh, will be able to commit taxes for fiscal year 09. That's sort of a technical subject that the council may be interested in. But for the benefit of the public who um, might well be interested. The ballot wording, there has been some question about why do we have the ballot wording that we have. The exact wording is mandated by the state law, um, the state school consolidation law. Um, so the exact wording on June 10th is exactly what the state says it has to be. New wording will go into effect on July 18th when the legislature's technical fix-ups legislation um, for the school consolidation goes into effect. But so any vote that might happen to be taken after July 18th would have slightly simplified wording. But the wording is in here, and I will let you read it. But um, that's why, if anybody's watching, 
That's why the wording is what it is, because it's mandated to be exactly that by the state law. The second thing, the second question is what happens or what school budget goes into effect on July 1st um, if a citizen vote in June fails? Uh, I have heard some people say, well, it, it flips to be, for instance, a 6% budget, the school um, board's budget. Um, if the, uh, it's all laid out again in the memo, but it's got sort of a three-part answer. From July 1st to July 17th, we will be operating under what is the current education law. And if during that period, the latest school board approved budget would become the school's operational budget until, and this is important, until voters approve a final, the final, final budget. So for those 17 days, that's the budget that would apply. From July 18th onward, the latest town council approved number, in other words, the latest one that was submitted to the voters, that would be the operational budget for the schools that would be in effect. However, again, the ultimate real, real, real school budget um, will be the one that is finally approved by the voters, if, no matter how many rounds it takes. And at that point, school expenditures that might have taken place between July 1st and whenever um, to that date will have to be reconciled with that final budget. I know that may be clear as mud to some people, but that's the best I could do, and hopefully the press will pick it up, and um, that's the definitive word as far as I understand. So I wanted to make sure that everybody, the council has a copy of this, and I'm sure um, if necessary, we can find a way to make it available at town hall or on the website or something like that if anybody wants to know um, more about it. And then the second thing is, um, and I heard reference to it among the, um, some of the comments from uh, people speaking at the public hearing tonight, um, and uh, it has become, uh, I've read in the press several references to exit polling and other ways to figure out what we should do if indeed enough people vote no for whatever reason on June 10th so that the, um, the June 10th vote fails. So the question I was thinking about is if the June 10th vote fails, how do we interpret it? And this is the question that a number of people in the audience brought up. What does it mean? Should the next round be a higher number, a lower number? What does it mean? There are problems um, with exit polls for a variety of reasons. I've spoken to an exit poller and I've done some research. There are problems with sampling error if the sample is not statistically significant. In other words, if you leave out all the absentee ballots, and quite a few people in Cape Elizabeth vote by absentee ballot because they wouldn't be there if they voted absentee to fill out an exit poll. You, the way exit polls work is you're supposed to sample every nth number, every tenth voter that comes through um, the polls. You cannot allow self-selection by the respondent. In other words, if people just go up to a table and say, I'll fill out your exit poll, that's not statistically valid because they're self-selecting. You really are supposed to reject the first nine and only pick the tenth or, or whatever. So there are sampling errors. Wording of questions can influence results. There's non-response bias. In other words, people refuse to be interviewed. Um, that skews the sample and the results. It's a particular problem according to the literature for younger pollsters or interviewers. They get lower response rates. There are problems with response bias. People sabotage the, ball, the, the poll by giving a false answer. Um, one reason is social pressure. They don't want to give an unpopular answer to a pollster. There's, there's a variety of problems. I, I could go on with that, but uh, the, it all boils down to the fact that I, I have some concerns about exit polling, not because of, uh, I know Mr. Jordan is one who has volunteered to do it, and my kids both had Mr. Jordan. He's an awesome teacher. I have no problems with him or the students who might be doing it, but they're not trained pollsters. And I think if we want to get information, we want to have accurate information, the school board and the town council. So I was trying to think how else could we get information that would give us good direction, higher number, lower number, if the June vote fails, as I think it might well, because I hear a lot of people say they want to vote no because it's too low. 
I, I've heard from a lot of people who have said, vote no because it's too high. I think of the 2,100 people in town who voted for Tabor, which would, be, would have been much lower than this. And if they vote no, and the people who think it's too low a number vote no, we're going to end up with a no vote. So how do we get that information? So I go back to the idea of an advisory, non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the town council um, and the, the school board. I think that would solve this problem. Every voter would get a chance to answer because absentee ballots, uh, people who voted by absentee ballot would get to weigh in on it. It would be directly from the people. It wouldn't be influenced by exit poll problems like sampling error or non-response rates or inexperienced interviewers, any of that kind of stuff. I think it would give clearer direction to both boards. There is a precedent. Similar language is allowed under Maine state law, Title 20A. It has been used successfully. These uh, advisory votes have been used successfully in um, other towns in Maine. It has been okayed. The idea has been okayed by the Secretary of State, the State Attorney General, and by an MMA legal opinion. Um, and I have spoken with the town clerk about it, and she has assured me that there is time to print the ballots um, and that she has no concerns about concerns. getting it done. I've run the, the wording by her. So I have something to pass out. I can find it here. Which is, it's sort of a two-part top and a bottom thing here. The top part just shows SAD 22's advisory ballot question. This is one that's been used for several years by them to give them an idea. Um, and then the slightly revised, it doesn't say MSA, it doesn't say SAD 22 on it. The language I'm proposing for an advisory question for the CAPE school budget would be a separate ballot at the June 10th election that would say the following is a non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the school board and town council. I find the school budget adopted at the, and I don't know if we have to put in the date, at the such and such date, June 10th, uh, I'm sorry, May 30th or whatever it would, would be, town council's school budget meeting to be, and then there's two boxes, too high or too low, and you check one. And that way, <coughs> excuse me, that way I think we would have harder information that would be seen as more, more valid um, than a, a more informal exit poll. And therefore, I would move that we have such a non-binding advisory question for the June 10th, 2008 election. Is, is there a second? I'll second the motion. Discussion? I think it's a great idea. I think uh, that, that would provide clarity that we need to make a good decision following a potential no vote. Would this be on the same page as the <coughs> question itself, or a separate piece of paper, or? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I believe that it does not have to be on the same page, but I'm not sure Ruthie is more of an expert on that. Well, I'm, I'm not certain I would have to uh, research that, but I, if it is on the same page, then we can um, have the tabulating machines uh, as the vote goes through, pick up those votes so that we would be able to have those determinations. Um, if it is a second page, we would be able to do that as well. I'm, I believe I can. I would be open to doing it either way, whichever works. I have another question. Is this mandated, this exact language, or would there be a way to actually have somebody be able to write what percentage they wish to see? I'm sorry, I missed. Could we ask, could we have a third line here with a little slash that said, what percent would you like to see and allow people to write it? Because this still doesn't give us quite as much guidance as we're going to need. Let's say the majority of people put check too low, then the council comes back. Do we say, OK, it's 6%? Or do we go, oh, OK, it's um, 4.7? I think if we have a fill in the blank, <laughs> we're going to run into problems of we could get, you know, a hundred different percentage answers. Um, I think it would be, uh, what if I'm looking for directional input. And since this is the language that's in the statute and has been vetted as okay by the state, uh, I would want to make sure it, I, I'm more, I personally am more comfortable with it being used like this, to follow this language. Cynthia? 
Well, I, um, <laughs> thanks to you, Marianne, I am now an expert on our rules about putting things on the agenda. And I guess I have some concern that I had done some research on this, and I, if, had I known that we were going to be deciding on the issue of an advisory ballot tonight, I think I would have brought the research with me or would have considered it prior to tonight's meeting, but I didn't know that. And so I'm just wondering if it's appropriate for us to take an item not on the agenda for a well, vote. Right I, think we're, I think it was an issue that um, the public brought up tonight. Um, I, it's perfectly appropriate to table it till the 27th if that's the pleasure of the council. And, and I would well. just ask that please uh, don't anybody make a motion to table because that will cut it off well, discussion. I mean, until we make sure that everybody's had a chance to say their piece. But, but I, can if I, I then I'll, I'll speak to it. I, <coughs> I think it's a good idea because I do think that, um, as was pointed out by a number of speakers tonight, we won't know what a no vote means. It could be too high, it could be too low. Um, I don't like making up some additional language because I think that gets really dicey and people call into question our motives. I am much more comfortable going with language that has been, um, that is in the statute and uh, has been used by other SADs. So, um, you know, Ruthie may want, I personally, I guess, would like to see that um, Ruthie's made some more um, inquiries inquiries into this and that we are satisfied um, because this is the first I've seen of it also that um, this is the appropriate language that's in the statute and and I think if we do it on the 27th that's timely for yeah, my only concern is I'm not sure about um, uh, printing the ballots that, that was my question you see what I mean it, and why would that be a problem because I'm not sure there's time to print the ballots. The absentee ballots are required to be available to the public seven days prior to the election. Required to looking well, at the 31st. We may not even have a vote seven days prior to the election. The state law says we have to vote sometime within the 10 days. So absentee ballots are required to be available seven days. The 31st was going to. My, my thought, that. if I could address this, yeah. my thought was that if we voted to go ahead with this <laughs> tonight, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice here, um, that uh, we would have time to print the ballots because the ballots don't have anything about, the, they don't have a specific number on them. In the same way that the mandated language from the state does not have a specific dollar number or percentage number on them, it's in that memo I gave you. Um, that's how Ruthie is going to be able to print the ballots, um, the, reg the first I understand. question, ballots. It's quite ironic that <laughs> the ballots can be printed before we take any vote because uh, I, I it, that agree. shows you how little the ballot actually communicates to the public. Mm -hmm. but, I, I, but I would also say that I've heard a number of people speak tonight saying that they would like um, I think this is a valid in, you know, direction. Um, so that they know which way to go. And I've spoken to a couple of school board members about it, just informally, and they are interested in having information. So that they, because it would loop back to them first before it looped back to us. Sarah. <coughs> I, I think <coughs> if we're putting forth, if we persist in putting forth a 4.6% budget, which I think we shouldn't on, on many grounds, which I won't bore you with because everyone here that spoke tonight, most particularly the students and that incredible teacher <clears throat> have already addressed it better than I could ever do. Setting aside the philosophical, moral issues and just addressing the practical one, I, I think the only way this is going to work is if we're willing to put to the to town vote a 6%, because a 6% is the top of what virtually every person that we've heard from tonight wants and so they would say yes yes and then all the other people that that, that this lower budget is presumably protecting that we didn't actually hear from could then check too high because it's an absolute it's the top of where we could go the 4.6 is this vague 
interim number that will give us no more information. So let's just do a hypothetical here. It looks pretty, pretty likely that the thing's going to be voted down, okay? So people vote it down, and a whole bunch of ch people check it's, it's, it's too low, and some people check it's too high, and we have no idea where to go, unless you take on faith that virtually everybody who checked it's too low is actually looking for a 6%, which would then be incumbent upon us to then put forth a 6% vote, thereby necessitating a whole other $3,000 vote. So what I'm saying is this makes no pragmatic sense to set forth a 4.6 and be able to only ask this question with no more specifics. It's going to give us no more guidance unless you're willing to commit, okay, if, if more people check too low, we will go to 6%. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we, we could have 10 votes before we get where we're trying to go. I, I, if, if I could respond, it seems to me that any number we picked, if, if it gets voted down, you're going to have to go one way or the other, march your way up or march your way down. And you, you are assuming, um, for a variety of reasons that we all know, um, that it would be voted down because most people would want it to be higher, would want 4.6 to be higher. And I would posit that the 2,100 people in town who voted for Tabor might be voting, if they vote no for this, would be voting no because they wanted the number to be lower. And so I think they're, this, the legislature put together this law and had a place for the leg legislative body of a town, which is us, the council, um, to have a role in the process. And the way the process worked was that the school budget goes to the local school board, comes through with their recommendation to us, then the legislative body, which for our town is the town council, has a role in sending whatever number they come up with to the public, and then the public decides. So I, th I think it is our role. I disagree with the people who said that we should just skip over the legislative body of but the town. you're not addressing my point. My point is there's not an arbitrary number on the high end. There's a very clear number because it's what the school board gave us. So, so people aren't saying, oh, we just want it higher in some degree, just like the people might say we want it lower. Every person we heard from tonight said we want to vote on the 6%. We want 6%. That's not arbitrary. They didn't pick that of a hat. That's what the, the, the school board and the school administration put forth to us after months and months and months. And I would remind you so that was a 4-3 vote. Just because, just because they checked, just because <coughs> the people check it's too low, it's not like they want an arbitrary amount higher. They want 6%. Sarah, can I suggest that if we were to put out 6% to the voters, we wouldn't need this question? Because Correct. we wouldn't need the question at all, but if we're not putting out 6%, but the, so I'm saying, question. why not put 6%? It's infinitely clearer. And if people in the town don't want it, they can vote it down. It just makes the process. This way is totally muddy. The other way is crystal clear. People either want it or they don't want it. But David, I, I think I, David. I, I, I'd just like to suggest that we focus the discussion on the question that we're talking about, which is not what number should be put on the ballot, but mm. whether has a huge there impact. should be an advisory. Well, but that's a discussion for our next meeting. As but to I what feel, number we send out but to I the feel, voters to put I on the ballot. I feel I can't vote on this with a, in any good conscience until I know what number we're putting out because I think it affects our decision on this. With a 6.0, I think I'm very happy with this. With a 4.6, this is way too vague for me. It doesn't give us enough information to. So you only want to hear from people if it's 6. No, I only want to hear a logarithmic thing, A or B, because if, <coughs> because 6% is a given in the community already. It's a target. Don't you see what I'm saying? If, if you put out 4.6, you have to let people explain or, or tell you what they want. I think people will be able to tell us they want higher or lower. Whatever number, then what will we whatever do? number the council, I mean, I wasn't in agreement with 4.6 in the first place, but whatever number the council decides to put out to vote for the public referendum, I would be happy to get feedback from the public through, through this mechanism whether they want it higher or lower. So let me just ask you as a practical <laughs> consideration, what will you then do? Okay, it's June 11th. We have all these things in front of us, and the majority have voted no, and the majority have said it's too low. Now what do we do? It goes to the um, school, school board. board. And they say we want a 6%, like we said before, and it comes back to us. What do we do? Well, then I think that's time for all of us to make our individual decisions then, what we'll do. So it could go on. But at least we'd have information. 
but not enough. Well, may I ask you something? Yeah, of course. Sir, sir I am the only one that has, has clearly, but I think that this isn't the time for it. I think that if they vote it down and they say it's too low, I think most of us can safely assume that they really wanted the six percent. But I think if they vote for it and it passes, then it's another matter. And I'm not you're 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 assuming that it's gonna vote it's gonna get voted down. But I'm not sure that you're right about that, given the history of what we've seen in the town in terms of Tabor, in terms of all these other issues. And we had a very vocal um, group here tonight, and they made great arguments. But I don't think they spoke to the entire town. They spoke to the school community. But I'm not assuming it's going to be turned down, but I'm saying what if we won't know where to go with that. If we put the 6% and it was voted down, we would know where to go with that. I understand what you're saying, but I, I, that's assuming that it'll get voted down. If it gets passed, then we don't have a problem. But what if it doesn't? Well, then we have to revisit it. No, we'll I, to have Sarah, meeting. I think we're making okay, the same points now. Um, I do think it's relevant to the discussion. Yes, Cynthia? <laughs> well, um, I, want to, I want to thank Anne very much for putting together this, or having Jeff Herman put together this memo. <laughs> um, and it, it's certainly, um, you know, helpful in understanding some of the issues. I don't see, though, in the memo a specific citation to that part of the law that says an advisory ballot. Oh, that's a completely separate thing. Yeah, that memo okay. doesn't have anything to do right. with the so advisory ballot. Uh, yes. There is a, I know, because I did this research, like I said, and had I known that we were going to be talking about it tonight, I would have brought it, but I don't have it. And so I'm just wondering, do you have a... Um, I have, hang on. And, and I guess it just... I have words, an email know. chain that you're included. This is probably what you're remembering, but uh, it has quotations from the Attorney General's office. The one that I got and sent Yes, to you? this is okay. like an email chain from, you know, there's like eight people in this row, but it, got, it kept getting forwarded, but the... Okay, uh, I will look at it. Can I just finish my thought? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought that's... Um, and, but before, so I'm, I'm thinking that a little bit more time would be helpful, but I just want to confirm what I think I heard, and that is that if we put off and table, I'm not making a motion to table, I'm simply positing this hypothetical, if we to table the one issue of, of, and ha of whether or not we want to have an advisory ballot, we could decide that issue on the 27th, and there would, in your opinion, or would not be time to have the ballots ready uh, for prior to June 10th. Um, I could um, set up a hand count uh, for those ballots. Um, they would not be pre-programmed to uh, read through the tabulating machines um, with the other state and, and uh, candidate refer the referendum and the candidate ballots. It would be a separate hand count. Um, for the election poll workers, it's possible to do. Um, it would just be, they'd be photocopied ballots as opposed to okay. pre-printed and pre-programmed. So it'd be more work and more time on your part. It would be, it would be less And more convenient. money. It will cost Correct. more. We'll have to pay people. Isn't the state pay for the first? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's, that's I'm so, I shouldn't problem. have laughed. <laughs> Those okay, next. Things. Sorry, Anne. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted no, to, no, I no. a question to read. I, I, I thought you were in. looking for that information, and I do have, I didn't make copies of it because I didn't have time, and I didn't think people would care. Could you but read it if you I, have I, it? I can, I can read it to you. It says, this is from David Logren, Logren, um, assistant to the, special assistant to the Attorney General. Uh, I have spoken with the attorney who works on education issues, and she says that there is nothing in Title 28 that would preclude a town from including an advisory question on a school budget ballot. That's the AG's office. The Secretary of State, and I want to thank Cynthia because she was the one who found out a bunch of this information. Um, the Deputy Secretary of State, Julie Flynn, said, we don't think there's anything prohibiting an advisory ballot for a state issue. Uh, the legislature, and then Paren, the legislature talked about doing this with term limits referendum, and the AG said nothing prohibits it. Um, but MMA and or DOE would be the ones to interpret this for a school municipal election. So Secretary of State didn't have any concerns. And then MMA, back at the beginning, the initial question was um, an opinion from MMA that it would be okay, but then Jim forwarded it to Cynthia, who checked with the Secretary of State's office and the AG's office. So I can forward, I think everybody, I don't know if I sent 
the final thank you email to everybody, but I can forward it to everybody if you want to see it all again. But I would urge that we just do this now because well, we've I, had a motion, yeah, and it's been seconded. <coughs> and unless there's further debate, David, there are is. Are we voting on the specific <laughs> wording or the concept? Which uh, I would be determined by. I would say David. that my motion is. I, I wrote this out so that I know what I was mo moving. Um, that we have such a non-binding advisory question paralleled on this language. And I used this language specifically. The, what I wanted to say was what's on the bottom half here of this sheet. The only thing I wasn't sure about was whether we needed to put in the date or not of our, of our decision. And I think Ruthie thought that would be a good idea. <coughs> we don't know the date of that. And the, but but the date has to be on the regular ballot. So That's I think correct. You will know whatever. the date we'll at some point. And when you do, we'll... Hopefully we'll know the date later the tonight. But Yes. If we know it later tonight. But, but the, the state language does not require a date. So, and your motion is this language yes. with a date to be the filled. Bottom just to half. be clear. And that was the second? The bottom mm -hmm. half. Okay. David, does that answer your question? Um, yeah. So two other <laughs> questions. One is, will it be on the same page will be on the lower half of the same ballot question that's asking yes or no. I, I would prefer that it be on the same page rather than a separate page because I think it'll be less confusing if we can do that. And the other question is if people vote yes or no and then they see another question down below, do you think it's too high or too low? I'm afraid that a lot of people will, <coughs> may vote uh, yes, I approve the budget and then they'll go down to too high or too low, and they'll check one. Yes, I approve it, but I think it's too high. Or yes, I approve it, but I think it's too low. <laughs> I, think I mean, I think that. people will do that. Yeah. However, um, if the So I, what I would like, if possible, is for us to add something after the yes or no that says, if you voted no on the above question, then answer the following. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, would I, not, that, uh, I would not much. agree with that. Um, I don't think that. I think that um, a budget is often a compromise. And I think there may be many people who go in, and I don't know what the number will be. I, we haven't set a number yet. But I think there will be a number of people who will go in and say, for whatever reason, that this is the number. I'm satisfied that it's got the vote of the council, and I'm going to do it. But I'm holding my nose to do it. I personally think it's a little too high or I think it's a little too low. And I think by saying you have to vote no, otherwise you're disenfranchised on your opinion, is going to encourage people to vote no. And we're going to have a series of advisory ballots through the summer. I mean, I think we're going to ask people their opinion. Everybody should get asked their opinion, just as if we were doing an exit poll we wouldn't discount the opinions right. of those who voted one way or another. I can accept that reasoning. Thank you. <laughs> I can't. I, mean, I, I think it's a risk. We'll see people go to the okay. site. They'll vote yes, and then they'll say too high or too low. But I guess that's Cynthia, then no Sarah. High. Well, I, I guess um, I, still, I have this uneasy feeling that I, I, don't, I haven't had an enough time to think about it and there's too many unknowns and so um, I, I think I'm generally uh, supportive of an advisory ballot but I, I feel that since it wasn't something that was on the agenda for our consideration for tonight's meeting um, and we haven't had I just want some more time to, to think about the concept so I'm going to move to table Can I? okay that's non-debatable is there a second There is no second, so we'll go back to the discussion. Sarah. Two questions. Number one, <laughs> when are we going to set this magical number? And number two, <laughs> would this council be adverse to a much more inf informal exit polling? I don't even want to call that an informal student temperature taking to ask people as they came out what, what was your number, just so we have some idea where to go. 
Does anyone want to respond to well, Sarah's on, question? Well, on setting the number, I'm not sure yet if we know which date we're setting the number on. I know we, That's we're going to vote on the 27th, I thought, but... Is that I, the day we set it? So we, we <laughs> discuss, set, and vote <coughs> on that night? We have we settled on voting on everything but the school budget on the 27th, and later this evening we were going to try and work through the um, inconsistencies in the state law and our town charter and decide what level of comfort we needed on the whole 10-day thing. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that later tonight. Could we move the question, perhaps? Okay. Move the question. All in favor? Of moving the question. Or of moving the question. One, what are we two, on? of moving the question. Oh. Of voting. We're voting to vote. Voting whether or not okay. to vote. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everybody, no, no. Want, everybody everyone wants, wants, to wants to vote. To vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All in favor? Of my motion. Of the motion to have proposed language for an advisory question on the ballot. And that would be... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. zero. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Democracy looks painful. <laughs> if some wise person said it was like what, making sausages or don't ever look at it. So here we go. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the education budget before Jim makes a motion to table that budget to the 27th? On the education budget? Yes, we're on item 71. I do have one comment. Okay, Paul? I think, um, I, you know, I sat here and listened to some really bright kids and, and, and some adults uh, speak about the budget. And I wrote down some terms that we used, and I just want to make some clarification. First of all, we're not, um, the council votes for an overall budget. I think people need to understand that. We don't set the details in the budget. The school board and the superintendent's office decides what gets added, what gets cut, you know, what gets changed. The council does not do that. That's number one. Secondly, we all value education. It was stated numerous times that somehow we don't value education because we didn't vote for the full budget. It's not true. Uh, thirdly, I don't think the schools are falling apart, and because we, if the council chooses not to increase the budget for the full amount that the school board requested, doesn't mean that we don't care about the schools. It just means we have to balance the needs of the taxpayers and the other expenditure needs that we have in town with the revenues that we have available. So. With this current proposed budget, which we have not decided on, ultimately, we already are talking about a 5.4% tax increase. 5.4% tax increase, that's if we go with a 3.3% town budget and a 4.6% school budget. I don't know if that's going to be the ultimate outcome, but I just wanted to clarify that so people understand where we're coming from. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And I had something very brief, and I just wanted to say the issue tonight, um, despite what some people seem to believe about cuts, what Paul was saying, cuts, the issue tonight is not whether we're cutting the budget. The issue um, tonight and then when we vote on the budget is how much more do we spend. I think that's, I think everybody on this board wants to spend us an increase. It, it ranges. Reasonable people can disagree about how much of an increase, but that's what the difference is. It is not about cutting back on the budget. Everybody on this group wants to spend, well, not wants, but it will, I'm sure, be voting to spend more. It's just how much more. So. Um, just to elaborate on that. It's an increase in the, uh, to taxes and an increase, but it actually represents cuts to the school in positions and programs and curriculum, as they've elaborated this evening. 
I, I just wanted to add a few things, a uh, few facts. Um, um, a lot of people talk tonight about 18 cents a day and 13 cents a day and four dollars a month um, and use the number 45 quite a bit and I want to make sure it's clear that what we're talking about is um, a, a 4.6 percent school um, budget increase will result in a, a coupled with the town budget will result in an increase on the so-called median $250,000 home of $220 annually to $4,335 annually. So it's not $45, it's $220. And um, I think it's important for people to understand that and not get confused that we're only talking about a tax increase of $45. We're not. We're already talking about $220 on the, the median home. Um, I also um, thought it was important to just recognize that um, even with a 4.6% increase, the schools will receive 71% of all locally raised tax dollars. So I think it shows that education remains the priority in this town. Um, Enrollment does continue to decline and has declined rather steeply. It's declined by 6% um, in recent years, um, but on a per pupil basis, spending from 08 to 09 at a 4.6% um, increase on a per pupil basis, that will be an increase of 7.9%. Um, so I think that. Again, I'm not sure exactly where we will turn out a couple of uh, weeks from now, but um, the differences that we're talking about, I think, are differences that reasonable people can disagree on, and in no way does a 4.6% budget show um, um, a disregard for the importance of education in this community. So. Um, I'm interested in continuing to hear from taxpayers over the next um, couple of weeks, uh, but I think it's important for people to have a um, broader perspective that they might not have heard tonight. Um, I just wanted to add that. And Jim, do you have a motion? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would uh, move that we table the proposed fiscal year 2009 Cape Elizabeth School Department budget recommending $19,656,037 in expenditures, which is an increase of $864,415, or 4.6%. Uh, $3,445,000 ,445 in revenues from sources other than property tax which is an increase of $211,326, or 6.53%, with $16,210,225 to be borne by taxation, which is an increase of $653,089, or 4.2%, with a projected property tax rate of $12.24 per $1,000 of assessed valuation. Is there a second? Second. Any oh, there's no discussion. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Um, the next item is the community services budget, item 73. Jim? Uh, excuse me, B72. Mm -hmm. Item number you don't, Jim, you don't need to read the whole thing. You can. Uh, yeah, this would be item number 72, though, I believe. The, the, uh, I'm come sorry. On. Cumberland County I assessment. skipped one. Thank you. Yeah. Item number 72, the Cumberland County Budget Assessment. Um, and you can dispense with the reading of okay. these. Okay. I would, I would uh, recommend that we table the 2008 Cumberland County Assessment uh, Two. Budget. 2009. 2009. Uh, 2009, excuse me. Second. All in favor? It be 7 0. Item 73, the Community Services Budget. I would move that we table the uh, proposed fiscal year 2009 community services budget. Second. All in favor? 
0-7-0. And item 74. Uh, I would move that we table the proposed fiscal year 2009 homestead exemption budget. Second. All in favor? B seven zero. Okay. I would like to move that we uh, treat items uh, number 75-2008 through number 81-2008 on block. All Second. in. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. And I would move that we adopt uh, the proposed fiscal year 2009 uh, budgets for the rescue fund, the sewer fund, the Spurwing Church uh, fund, the Riverside Cemetery, the Fort Williams Park capital budget, the proposed Portland headlight budget, and the proposed Thomas Jordan trust budget. Second. For discussion. All in favor? <coughs> Seven zero. Okay, now we're at item 82, which is uh, changes to the Thomas Memorial Library circulation policy. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Lynch. Th th these particular proposed changes have been studied by the trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library for about a year now. Uh, they also had a, a committee and the library staff looked at them. A, a considerable amount of time uh, has been spent on them. I would uh, encourage the council to adopt the changes as presented by the trustees of the Thomas More Library. Okay, is there a motion? I propose, I make a motion we uh, accept the proposed changes from the Thomas Memorial Library uh, trustees. Is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion. Anne? I, um, I intend to vote for this, but I have just two brief questions that will not stop me from voting it on it, but perhaps the manager could direct them to the, I don't think Jay, Jay's not here. On the uh, second page of Jay's memo, about half to two-thirds of the way down, it says reserves the proposal to remove the service of intervening in the automated, automated reserve list results from the enormous volume of the holds traffic. I, I don't even know what that means, and I just appreciate an after-the-fact explanation of that. I'll ask him for that. And then on the next um, page, which is the text, the, the marked up text, mm -hmm. in the, uh, under the section called residents, the second paragraph, says non-residents will pay a non-refundable annual membership fee equal to the current per capita cost per resident as set by the town council. Do we set that? I don't, no. I don't remember that it, we set that. No, but it ties in. You don't set it, but it, you simply take the library budget and you divide it by... The town uh, residents. Oh, that's by the number okay, of residents. Now I understand. You that. indirectly said it. I was Burked thinking out. we yeah. passed yeah. it somehow. Okay, thank okay. you. That explains it. Okay, those were my only there questions. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? It would be 7 0, Ruthie. And the next item on our agenda is to enter into executive session in accordance with 1 MRSA section 40560D to review the status of collective bargaining. Um, the I have a citizens discussion first. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say something as a citizen. Linda Mall is sitting here in the audience and <laughs> is a reporter for the Southern Forecaster. She has been for the last nine years, I believe, uh, initially covering a lot of communities on the northern end of Portland and then was assigned about three years ago to cover Cape Elizabeth. She officially retired on Friday uh, from the forecaster and, and is here working for the forecaster this evening. And, uh, and she, you know, she may be from time to time, but, but she's officially now retired. And I just wanted to wish Linda well and thank her for keeping the Cape Elizabeth residents in Okay, thank you. I'm glad you pointed that out, Mike. Um, returning to our agenda, item 83 is to enter into executive session in accordance with 1 MRSA section 4056D to review the collective bargaining agreements. Um, are you expecting to ask us to take any action? No, not publicly, okay. but you do need to. So we will go into executive session. We do not intend to take any action on the contracts. Um, we will come out of executive session, and then we will have a ha just the housekeeping item of trying to schedule a day 
it complies with the charter and the state law. Anyone wants to know those dates can email us or call us in the morning if you don't choose to stay to wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they took the hint. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, my goodness.